I'm Bill Crystal. Joining me today is Elliot Abrams, who's held senior positions in the State Department in the Reagan administration and in the White House in the George W. Bush administration. Elliot, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Did you expect to serve <clears throat> over 15 years in the State Department in the White House when you first came to Washington? <clears throat> I didn't. I came to Washington to work for the late Senator Henry M. Jackson, Scoop Jackson, in the Senate and uh, to go home, which was New York. I thought I'd be here for, you know, a couple of years and then leave town. Uh, so it, and I actually did s spend more than four years in the Senate, uh, but then Ronald Reagan got elected. And, you know, when I came here, I thought of Ronald Reagan as a sort of movie star. The idea that he'd be president and I'd work for him was not in my mind. Well, tell me more about that. So you <coughs> came as a, you worked for a Democratic, two Democratic senators. Well, right? I was a Democrat, uh, raised as a Democrat in New York City, and I was a Democrat. And, um, I would say a hardline Democrat, a hardline foreign policy Democrat in, as we thought, you know, the tradition of Truman and, and uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, in fact, in 1968, when I was still in school, I was for Humphrey for the Democratic nomination for president, not Gene McCarthy or Bobby Kennedy. Um, but I had actually worked in the um, 1972 embryonic Scoop Jackson campaign. Um, One of up, many up, successful yeah. you know, political <laughs> endeavors. Up right? at Harvard, and I think that's where we that's where met. We met yes. um, and I told Jackson then, if you run in 76, I want in. Um, and he did run in 76. So I was by then out of law school and um, <clears throat> um, on board, let's just say, with the practice of law in New York. And so I uh, made the decision on my birthday, I'm out of here, and told uh, Scoop, I'm ready to come down. This was 1975. Um, to work for him in the Senate, but with the notion that this was preparing for the 76 campaign. And did you stay on the Senate staff through the 76 campaign? Or, <coughs> excuse me, or did. did you actually work on the campaign? No, I, I stayed on the Senate staff. He was chairman of the Permit Subcommittee on Investigations, which is where we kind of sent me for a while. Um, and then I worked on his personal staff. Uh, I think I worked on the campaign for a week. Um, and then Scoop said, no, 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 I said, I want him in the Senate. So. I was on the Senate staff. Uh, Jackson's campaign ended on April 27th, 1976. It was the Pennsylvania primary. I remember it. I was up in Philadelphia for, we hoped, a party. It was nice. a wake. Um, he pulled out, and we all supported from scoop on down the guy who was supposedly the most conservative candidate left, a guy named Jimmy Carter. And did you vote for Jimmy Carter? Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to answer that. It's a I, secret I ballot. I happily you know. voted for Jimmy Carter. Um, <laughs> but I stayed with scoop right on through 1976, I wrote a number of, we should go back and check, I thought excellent bicentennial speeches for him <laughs> to give at colleges in Washington State. But then in November, a guy named Daniel P. Moynihan got elected uh, senator from New York. And so you moved over and worked for Pat Moynihan for how long? I worked for Pat for two and a half years. That so that was been interesting. two years scoop, two years Pat. Yes, I mean, it was interesting. It was, uh, it was difficult, as, as you know, because you knew him. Moynihan was a brilliant man and a great public servant and impossible to work for. I actually think, um, uh, to put it straightforwardly, he was ruined by the United States Senate in this sense. When you, you think of him, the Moynihan Report on the Negro Family, uh, you think of the U Moynihan as UN ambassador. These were the greatest moments in his public life. As a senator, he was a politician in a liberal state where there was even a New York State liberal party. Um, and I think that as time went by, he became less and less the great Moynihan that we knew and more and more a Democratic Party politician whose ability to act was, was um, limited by New York State politics. And I do think Moynihan's contributions when people now read about him are much more what he wrote uh, in social science and what he did at the UN probably than any particular accomplishments in the Senate, don't you think? I, mean, I think that is right. In fact, if you think of his Senate career, what do you think of? He opposed Bill Clinton's welfare reform, which right. is probably the best thing Clinton did. Right. So I, I think, um, now I don't know what Pat would have done had he not gone into the Senate, where he was for 24 years, but um, there aren't many great contributions, and I think it's because of the um, <clears throat> contradiction between his own views and the political situation of the New York State Democratic Party. 
come back to Scoot Jackson for a minute, since I think you admired him very much. Yep. He died too young in, what, 1982, I think? Yep. Um, what was he like? I mean, people don't Scoop, remember him as much as maybe right. they should today, you know. It's been a long time. Scoop was, uh, unlike Pat, was not a, a sort of dynamic individual. And he was, I would say, not an intellectual, certainly not in the sense that Boynihan was. <clears throat> he was a great senator. Um, first of all, he was a great politician. And, uh, you know, from Washington State, and great politician in a couple of senses. One, the oldest-fashioned baby-kissing sense, that is, People would come in from the state and say, hi, we're the Johnsons, you know, from, from uh, some county or city. And he'd say, oh, the Johnsons, your uncle was county attorney in 1906. I mean, <clears throat> it was like that. He had an amazing memory. He also had the ability to work the Senate. He was a great master of the Senate. And that is a talent that I think a lot of <clears throat> academics and intellectuals don't understand. I mean, I can remember that we would say to him, uh, he'd say, well, I'm going to get this bill passed, and I'm going to get this amendment passed. And we'd say, that, that really, I how could that possibly? And he would say, well, I told Russell Long that I would vote for this if he would vote for that. And he said he would vote for that if, if uh, Senator Magnuson would allow his son-in-law to be the U.S. attorney for... But that would only work if then up in May, I mean, and this was a kind of Rube Goldberg device with 18 moving parts um, that nobody else could follow. But he, in that sense, he was a great senator. His, much of what he achieved was literally in the Senate. Of course, then he became a national leader on foreign policy, opposing uh, initially the Nixon-Kissinger detente foreign policy um, and then the Carter foreign policy. I mean, you know, one forgets, people don't, today don't even know that a good chunk of the opposition to Nixon Kissinger detente was from the right and from Democrats, from Scoop Jackson, but also, in fact, from Pat Moynihan when he was UN ambassador. He served under Kissinger in a sense in that job, but also clashed with Kissinger, I believe. Um, it really wasn't the Democratic Party was awfully different then, but that was the Democratic Party that you signed up for and that you came to Washington <clears throat> to work for, right? Well, it was changing. I mean, uh, you know, it starts in 1968 over the Vietnam War, um, Johnson's resignation, McGovern's nomination in 1972, um, and, and it looked as if there was going to be a change back to a kind of um, Johnsonian Truman, real strong foreign policy with Jimmy Carter, who had run in a way to the right of Gerald Ford for president, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Carter having, you know, Navy captain. Um, but it didn't turn out that way. And it was striking to us in the Jackson camp that when Carter became president, our group was absolutely excluded from the administration. You know, it didn't matter much to me. I was very young. I was going to get some big job anyway. But there were people of, you know, the right age to get significant jobs. Nothing. And uh, Scoop and Moynihan opposed Carter on some things very early, right, in 1977? Well, I think <clears throat> part of it was uh, the personnel question. That is, on the one hand, we're excluded. I mean, one of the people in the Jackson neocon camp, uh, and we didn't use the word neocon then, but let's just say hardline Democrats, uh, hawks, Cold War Democrats, uh, was named the president's special negotiator for Micronesia. There were talks about the independence of Micronesia, and I said at the time, we didn't even get Macronesia, you know, we got <laughs> Micronesia. Um, that had a lot to do with that, I think, the sense that, wait a minute, they've made a decision. We don't want you. Well, who did they want? <clears throat> if I remember correctly, Moynihan's first speech, certainly his first significant one, on the floor of the Senate was opposing the nomination of a man named Paul Warnke, to head the Arms Control and Disarmament Administration. What was that all about? It was about detente and Nixon and Kissinger, and, and, and it, it showed you where the Carter administration was going. And it was exactly what Jackson and Moynihan in, in supporting Carter had thought was not going to happen. And when you left the Hill in 78, I guess it was, or 79, <clears throat> when you left working for... When did I leave? 79. 79 yeah. for Moynihan. Did you realize, basically, you were probably going to leave the Democratic Party, or the, the future was with the Republicans, A, and B, I'm curious what people like you, you know, people who are already active in politics, cared a lot about foreign policy, 
What did you think of Ronald Reagan? I mean, how, at what point did you did people start to realize that Reagan? I mean, as I remember, I was a little younger. You know, still he was kind of former governor, had lost in 1976. Uh, pe people were dubious that he was going to be the the leader of America during the 1980s. You know, I mean. Well, we were. <clears throat> first of all, none of us knew this guy, right? We were Democrats. Most of us are from the East. He's the governor of California. Um, I don't think. I don't think. Reagan was such a big figure in our minds then. The question was within the Democratic Party. We formed a, one of the many, you know, um, NGO-type organizations. This was called Coalition for Democratic Majority um, that had a bunch of conservative Democrats. We were still um, fighting in the Democratic Party, but the question became, what do you do in 1980 about the re-election of Jimmy Carter? Remembering that he had gone, in our view, way off on foreign policy, Andrew Young as UN ambassador, meeting with the uh, PLO, saying that the Cuban troops in Angola were a force for stability. There were a bunch of incidents like this. <clears throat> um, we were asked to meet with Carter. Who's we? You know, Jim Kirkpatrick, Norman Podhoretz, Midge Dechter, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, Max Kampelman, conservative Democrats, uh, hardline Democrats, were invited in by Mondale. I, my memory is this is about May 1980, and the campaign, of course, is going. So and Reagan Carter's is, already beaten back the Kennedy challenge in the primary, I suppose. That's yeah. my memory, and, and Reagan is more and more clearly, he is the Republican nominee, though not officially yet. And Mondale <clears throat> called us in. We went, we, met, we went to the White House, which is, of course, a big deal, uh, and we met in the cabinet room. And uh, Mondale came in, and he was terrific, I have to say. Basically you know, pulling on the heartstrings, you're all Democrats, come on, you're not going to support this actor from California. And the, He was very, he, he did it well. Uh, and after he spoke and chummed around for around, I don't know, 20 minutes, in comes the president. <clears throat> Again, great honor for us. Um, and uh, we had agreed, one of us, Austin Ranney, who was the head of the American Political Science Association, would speak. And uh, he spoke for about 10 seconds before Carter cut him off because he started by saying, you know, Mr. President, we, everybody here voted for you. We want to support you. And um, we, in essence, he said, we like your new foreign policy. What was new? After the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, it got a little tougher. Uh, and and Rani said, so we like the new foreign policy, if you will, the second foreign policy. And that took about 15 seconds to say. And then uh, Carter interrupted him and said, I don't have two foreign policies. I have one foreign policy. My foreign policy has not changed, as I remember it in that tone, too. And he then went on for a few minutes. And uh, by the end of the meeting, everybody in the room was for Reagan, including me. I mean, all of us listened to this and said, wow, it's as bad as we feared. Uh, there's no change in the foreign policy. It will be four more years. And I, I think, I don't want to say everybody in that room voted for Reagan. Certainly the majority did. And a number of us then worked on the Reagan campaign and went into the administration. Yeah, I've often thought I didn't learn certain things by not working on the Hill. You know, it was always kind of a mystery to me when I was in the executive branch dealing with Congress. You, you had a better feel for it, I'm sure, but do you, do you recommend it to young people? Is it good to work on the Hill? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I recommend it to all of them, including when people come and say, you know, I've got a job offer from a doofus congressman and not what I wanted, take it. And the reason I say that is <clears throat> it's, it's unique. Um, everything passes before you. You know, in the State Department, you're doing foreign affairs. In, in the Agriculture Department, you're doing that. You work for a congressman or senator, literally everything comes before you. You've got to vote on everything. And you're an ombudsman. So you've got to deal with constituents' problems with the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Administration, I mean, you name it. There, I don't think there is, maybe except for being president of the United States, there isn't another position where literally the entire federal government uh, is before you, and I think, you know, for a young person, it's fantastic to see that. A. B. Politics. I mean, there is, there's the, the politics of the state, the nomination for Congress, who's in the next district, how do two senators relate to each other, same party or opposite parties? How do the senators relate to the congressional delegation of that state? The fact of the Congress <clears throat> and the outside world, that is, if you're a senator, you know, the most important other 99 people in the world to you are senators. Right. I mean, they're the people who you see every day on the floor, in the gym, in the hallway, who can make your life miserable or 
enable you, because, you know, you don't need the president's vote in a sense. You don't need Margaret Thatcher's vote, Ronald Reagan's vote, going back to those days. You need the vote of those other 99 people. Um, so watching a politician, uh, and, and remember, <clears throat> we're talking about people that here who are, we hope, statesmen, who are, we hope, great public officials, but the one thing they have in common is they're politicians. So I think particularly if you view yourself as a policy intellectual, that's a fantastic education. Yeah, I always recommend to young people also to work on campaigns, which I sort of got into by accident. I worked a little bit on the Moynihan campaign in the summer of 76 for the Senate in New York and then ran actually a losing Senate campaign in Maryland for a Republican in 1988. And it was a hopeless campaign and, you know, not that pleasant a day-to-day -day experience when you know you're going to lose and you're trying to raise money to get a few ads up on the air. But I always thought I learned more about America. I mean, I always think it was a very good experience to have actually had to be part of a campaign. I mean, do you also agree? You, I guess you worked, well, you, you, you worked in effect on the Jackson campaign, though not as a, though you were on the Senate staff, and then you helped Reagan in 1980. And, and I did work on the Jackson campaign in 1976. 72. Uh, 72, rather, right. when I was in law school. Um, yeah, I, I recommend it, I, I think, again, particularly for people who's, for whom electoral politics is not going to be their life. Right. Uh, it's an exposure, but there's something else one has to say, too, that I'm constantly telling young people, college students, you know, um, Washington is a place with two teams, and you need to choose a team. You cannot play this sport until you're on a team. So whatever your interest is, let's say it's foreign policy, as mine was, um, which team are you on? Choose up, get involved in the campaign, uh, choose sides in Congress, and, and you really can't move back and forth maybe once in your lifetime. I mean, we're all not Winston Churchill. So maybe you've got right, one right. ability to do it, 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 one opportunity in your life. Um, so that's another reason to get on a campaign. And I think the, the, um, there's a tendency on the part of people who come up, you know, through uh, college, grad school, law school, um, magazines, NGOs, uh, to overlook the, 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 the central activity here, the central activity for congressmen, senators, presidents, is politics. They got to get elected first. Right. Right. No, I've been very struck by that too. I mean, that you really, uh, the people who come into government from universities, uh, from magazines, from think tanks, sometimes fail to see the centrality of, of politics. Well, I remember a, a um, time when when uh, George Shultz called in Robert Strauss. We're talking about uh, late administration of of um, Ronald Reagan, probably eighty six. Uh, seven. Um, Bob Strauss, a senior Democrat, <clears throat> you know. A very uh, senior Democrat, right. a Democratic wise man right. at that point, of course, out of the government, the Reagan years. Um, and uh, Strauss advised him, you need to go up to the Hill and you need to see these leading Democrats. Um, and what was interesting to me was what I failed to do. And just to show you don't learn all the lessons you need, we found out really, really angered who? The senior Republican. <laughs> because what Schultz should have done was to realize this is a political game above all. <clears throat> I'm on a team. Strauss is probably right. It's good to see the Democratic leadership after. So even if your goal is a narrow foreign policy goal, I need to get this done, I need your support, um, the, the political exposure, and particularly, again, the Hill political exposure, where you realize the extent to which teams matter, that is, um, it, it, it's, it's not all-encompassing. But I would say it's much more, it's much closer to all-encompassing now. It's one of the changes. Uh, I don't, you know, it sound like I've been in Washington for 100 years, but, right. but I did start on the Hill decades ago. And I think there was a lot more cross-party activity. Uh, I think people were able to deal with each other as individuals. And in the story I told, you know, Jackson's um, maneuvering with this senator, that senator, I'll support him if you... Party was less important in that kind of situation. Um, I think that's changed. Um, I think uh, the, the sense of um, being divided into two opposing teams, two teams that really uh, cannot get along, find it hard to work together, there, there was a lot less of that. Um, and it's, it's a lot worse now, which is, I think, one of the reasons you see senators quitting after a term or two. 
but they don't they can't work across the aisle and cut deals as well the way they liberate themselves from their own leadership I think as much as someone like him. did Scoop Jackson take orders from who was the Senate majority leader then I don't well, even know. Well because in his earlier days it was a guy named Lyndon Johnson and then right. you know after uh, Mike Mansfield who right. was not a dictator. Right. Now, I think <clears throat> um, I think a big part of the problem here TV when I got to the Hill, in fact, I remember my first day, um, Jackson's foreign policy advisor, the late Dorothy Fosdick, said to me, you know what you could do for us today, your first day, go cover the markup of the committee on this or that. Now, I didn't know what a markup was. I'd never heard the term before. Um, what was a markup? In those days, a markup was a place where senators and staff would sit in a closed room and make the deal. They would literally mark up the draft legislation, mark it up with pens and pencils, come out with a deal. And, the, and it was closed? Literally closed. So I mean, no reporters, say, no TV. Um, yeah, and one senator could say I mean, another, you could get in because you were a Senate staffer, Senate staff, but right. no, no outsider. <clears throat> right. No outsider, no lobbyists, no TV. And they would do deals. And they would say to each other, OK, look, it says 30 million. I know you're asking for 40, but come on. Uh, that's just lobbying crap. What, what, do you, what do you need? Can you get, I can do 32. Is that, you could make that kind of deal. Done. Markups are now open to not only lobbyists, to the press, and there are cameras, just as there are now cameras on the Senate floor. Warren Magnuson was the other senator from Washington State along with Scoop. And let me put it this way, he was real fat. <laughs> he was slovenly. You don't have that anymore. I mean, the people in Washington State didn't care that they had a fat senator, but <laughs> He was because he was a great senator. Um, he was a really effective legislator, Magnuson. And as I think back to the Senate when I got there, uh, the last quarter of the 20th century before TV, you had a lot of senators who were old, who had bad bad haircuts, bad suits, um, overweight. It it didn't matter, and it matters now because you have cameras everywhere now, and you got a lot of guys who spend apparently a very large amount of time having their hair done. <laughs> Um, the John Edwards effect. You right, know? right, right. Um, this is not an improvement in the quality of legislators, legislation, or the activity of the body. A and, you know, it's uh, open government, right? Why do you have closed markups where people can't get in and see what's going on? It's not an improvement. They were actually governing better then, I would say, with a closed markup where deals could be done. Yeah, no, it's it is remarkable. I mean, I, by the time I got here, I think the markups were already opening up, or maybe had opened up, and and that it, that's you read about that old Senate, but it, it really changed quickly, though, don't you think? By the mid late '80s, it was already a different yes. institution. Uh, I, mean, uh, it, it, I agree with you. It changed, and you know, after uh, 200 years, it changed in five years. Yeah, um, and and you, there aren't very many of those old style senators, and. Um, it's much tougher to get work done. So tell me about Reagan and the, uh, first of all, you, so you helped out on the campaign in 1980. So you were back practicing law for, for a while. Back, I actually, <clears throat> after leaving Scoop, stayed in Washington. Practiced law here, found it as boring as practicing law in New York. Um, we so there was. Look, yeah, we should cut this part <laughs> out for the prospective lawyers out there who are, you know, no, no, cramming no, no, no. for their second year law exams or whatever. Uh, I do always, um, tell people I thought law, I thought and think law school is a terrific intellectual experience. That doesn't mean you have to practice law uh, for your whole life. But I, I um, worked on the campaign, um, and there's no question in, uh, I wanted to go in. I mean, I wanted, I'd had enough practicing law, and I wanted to go back to government, and I hoped Reagan won. I actually worked um, on the campaign with the American Jewish community. And, uh, Spent some time in Florida. And when we won, uh, this is really, uh, it sounds like a, a sort of bad movie, but I had worked for um, two people who were very influential in the campaign. One of them, uh, William Casey, uh, I believe was campaign manager actually, officially, right. and then of course head of the CIA. And, um, you know, the thought was okay, you worked on the campaign, we won, now I get something, right? And I actually went to see Casey, who, uh, my memory may be playing tricks, but as I recall, I said, what do you want? <laughs> um, and I had figured out what I wanted by then and asked for it and remarkably enough got it. Um, I, um, you know, I had no area expertise. I couldn't say, you know, I'm a great Asia specialist. I'm a great Africa specialist. Um, but Moynihan had, after all, been ambassador to the UN, so I thought I'd go work in the uh, 
UN Bureau at State, the International Organizations Bureau. Uh, of course, when I worked for Moynihan, he was a senator, so it, 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 <laughs> one thing had nothing to do with the other, but I knew that people would think it did. Yeah, that's so Moynihan, best. UN, sort of. And actually, I went to see Pat Moynihan to say, this is my thinking, and therefore, I think that I will go to see Casey and the other couple of guys and say, I'd like to be Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs. And Moynihan, we were having lunch, we were having a few drinks, and Moynihan said, Deputy Assistant Secretary? Deputy? And I said, you mean I, you think I should? And he said, basically, what? Ask. Ask to be Assistant Secretary. So I went and saw Casey, and I said, I want to be Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs. And he said, huh, oh, yeah, oh, it sounds good. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I'll talk to Haig. And that's who was, kind of... Who had been nominated right, to be Haig, Secretary of Haig, State. who yeah. I never met. And I got a call uh, saying, General Haig would like to see you. Um, and I went and saw him, and he offered me the job. Is so, that right? Yeah. And you were like, weren't you the youngest, I don't know, Assistant Secretary of State at that point? To, I to was. Be nominated yeah, I was or? 32. And uh, I think nobody had, at least at that point, nobody had, had been that young. Um, so I went in. Uh, the you get nominated, you got confirmed without a problem by the Actually, Senate? I worked on the, um, I should say, at, at the time I was working on the transition team, which of course Reagan, like everybody else, set up after his victory. And when I went into the State Department building as part of the transition team, presumably around Thanksgiving of 1980, that was the first time I'd ever set foot in the building. Is that right? Yes. That's crazy. Um, I knew where it was, but I never actually been there. <laughs> right, you've driven past it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and by the way, you, you say you've driven by it. Uh, how did you get to the State Department, though? It's another sign of change in Washington. The State Department has a semicircular driveway, so you would take a taxi. And the taxi driver would drive into the semicircular driveway, which was good in case it was raining, you know, you right. walk. Of course, the whole street is now closed since 9-11, uh, but yeah. in those days, you could drive right up. Um, so I was, <clears throat> I was nominated, I think, uh, right away. Haig did all his nominations, and this is another change. Uh, the speed, I, my memory is I was confirmed in April, which is two months after the president comes in uh, unanimously. Um, so I did that job, although actually I only did it for seven months or something. Like yeah, so that. give us, so you spent eight years, basically the entire Reagan administration in the State Department, in which jobs? And Well, I, I started in this UN job. And so that's Assistant Secretary of State for International, International Organization, Organization, Organization Affairs. Where and you, you supervise? You supervise the UN, in theory, the UN system. And it's not just New York, because there's UN Geneva, there's the IAEA in Vienna, there's uh, environmental stuff in Kenya. There's The problem is, <clears throat> we have a thing called the UN Ambassador who is often a member of the cabinet, Gene Kirkpatrick was, but always a big shot. Um, and it is always the case that the Secretary of State and the UN ambassador clash. And Haig and Kirkpatrick did. And in that little clash, in the middle is the Assistant Secretary for I.O. getting crushed. That's good. Um, it's a good introduction to government, though. 32, 32 years old, <laughs> you know, caught between General Haig and, 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 and Ambassador yes, Kirkpatrick. Right. After, I will, <clears throat> a year, they were not speaking. Is that I mean, right? Messages had to be carried by people like the then Under Secretary of State, uh, Walter Stessel, um, or me. Um, staffs were conspiring against each other. And these were, remember, we're not, we don't have big ideological differences here or party differences. Um, and we're all in love with President Reagan. It's bureaucratic. Um, it's people fighting over the same piece of turf. And I was crushed in the middle. Um, what happened was that uh, for my benefit was that um, the, the Reagan nominee for Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights uh, could not be confirmed, the late Ernest Lefevre. Um, and in fact, Haig contemplated eliminating the position, which he couldn't do without legislation, it was very foolish. Um, but the Deputy Secretary asked me to think through uh, what should we do with this position and who should hold it. And so I think that had been invented by Carter, right? Or right. human rights exactly. job. It, it, didn't it exist had been before. invented by Carter. Right. And there was some talk among Republicans of trying to get rid of it. It was dumb politically. Um, I saw my escape hatch here. So I <laughs> went back to the deputy secretary and said, I have, a pe uh, I have a candidate for you. Suave, handsome, you know, well-dressed, brilliant. And he said, okay, fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really want to do it? And I said, yes. He said, write it up, and I did, and wrote a memo about what would a Reagan 
Republican, conservative, right-wing human rights policy look like. And they liked it. Um, that is, Deputy Secretary Clark liked it, White House liked it. I got that job in December of 81 and kept it uh, through the first term. Um, but uh, toward, the en and toward the end, I thought, you know, I should try something else, right? Reagan's going to be president for eight years. We thought we'd maybe be an ambassador. That'd be great. Ambassadors get big houses and staffs, and we had three little kids. So that, you know, that sounded good. But the, um, the work I had done was largely, probably more, about Latin America than any other region because uh, in that period, the Latin countries were, with only, I think, two exceptions, military dictatorships, which we were trying to move toward democracy. Um, when the Assistant Secretary for Latin America uh, told Haig, uh, uh, Schultz by then, Haig only lasted a year and a half, and then George Schultz was Secretary, <clears throat> he told Schultz he was going to leave and go back home to Alaska. Um, I had a call from, actually my number two, my deputy had a call from Schultz's assistant saying, does Elliot speak Spanish and does he speak it well? And my deputy said, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, actually he does. Why? He said, well, nothing. And, you know, a day later I got the call saying, uh, we want you to be Assistant Secretary for Latin America. I did that for the rest of the administration. So you were Assistant Secretary of State for three years under President Reagan, and people forget now, but that would, you know, human rights had been a Carter uh, initiative, really. It almost introduced it, you might say, to American foreign policy, uh, at least in, that, in those terms, made a huge focus of his, criticized by a lot of conservatives. I think you played an important role in somehow making human rights a conservative a doctrine or a policy uh, priority of a conservative administration, of the Reagan administration. We'll talk about that. Well, we, we, um, you're absolutely right that we, um, a lot of us on the Republican side, or let's say the hardline side, because in those days I was still a Democrat, you were still a Democrat in, in the I Reagan administration? Was. I was in officially Democrats for Reagan during the campaign, and then I was not asked to change party, nor was, say, Jean Kirkpatrick, um, until, I think, the second year, uh, the second job, I think, when the second Assistant Secretary of Human Rights, as I recall it, uh, Lynn Nofziger, the Director of Politics of the White House, said, would you be comfortable doing this? And by then, the answer was yes, so right. I did it. Um, our criticism of the Carter human rights policy was that it was human rights policy as, as kind of foreign aid. That is, <clears throat> 13 guys are arrested, so we'll try to get the 13 guys out of prison. Uh, not a systematic attempt to change a dictatorial system into a democratic system, first. Second, the heavy pressure was hitting our allies, uh, pro-Western people, not, for example, Fidel Castro in Cuba, but rather people in places like South Korea and the Philippines and Central America um, and in f Iran. I mean, it was 1979 was the year in which the Shah of Iran fell and the Somoza, Somoza dictatorship in uh, Nicaragua fell, both of which, you know, was fine as long as they were replaced by a more democratic regime. And, of course, that did not happen in either case. So we thought, well, how is this a gain for human rights? So our, we developed a kind of um, conservative human rights policy which called for systemic change um, and which also called for helping lay the foundation for a democratic follow-on regime. Because what had happened, we thought, in Nicaragua in 1979, Iran 79, was what happened in Cuba in 59, which was that you had a vacuum. And into that vacuum, the best organized other forces, the communists in the Latin cases and the Ayatollah Khomeini's forces in Iran jumped. They f jumped in and they took power. They seized power. Once they seized it, it's very hard to get it away from them. So we had to prevent them from seizing it by helping moderates be ready. Um, that was the critique. Uh, and so I thought, you know, well, why should Republicans, why should conservatives take the position <clears throat> we're against human rights. Haig made a terrible mistake early on in the administration saying in a press conference what human rights was for the Carter administration, fighting terrorism will be for the Reagan administration, which was really, first of all, I think not true, but secondly, silly to say, even if it were true, because uh, it just riled people up. Um, I would have to say, to be candid, that Secretary of State Haig 
never really got this argument about human rights and was not interested much in it. When you're in a week in, in the State Department, I should back up 10 seconds, there are regional bureaus, Africa, Asia, Latin America, those are the dukedoms. They run the world. They liaise with the ambassadors, the embassies, and they're big shots. And they're called what are called functional bureaus, like the Economics Bureau, the Human Rights Bureau. Um, and they're much weaker, because everything that happens really happens through the regional bureaus to the embassies. So if you were Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, everything depends on the Secretary. When you go to the Assistant Secretary for Asia or Latin America and say, we need to say X, and we need to protest Y, and we do, you know, he or she can basically say, go back to your office, please. Right. Not if the Secretary is on your side. And early on, Schultz. Uh, so you become Assistant Secretary of Human Rights under Hague. Yeah. And there you are, young guy, your second Assistant Secretaryship, a weak bureau, kind of tainted by the sense that it's a Carter leftover. Yes. And you don't get that far under Secretary Haig? I mean, you're making, I mean, uh, how do you operate as a young political appointee in that kind of environment? I mean, you, you operate by making non ideological arguments. Um, Guatemala is a good example because I remember when we cut off uh, military aid to the Lucas Garcia regime, it's in 1981. It really it deserves the term fascist, murderous regime in Guatemala. Um, nobody wanted to hear the argument that we should be purer than pure, and this is, you know, for human rights reasons, we have to cut them off. The winning argument was, no, 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 uh, there's going to be no military aid to Guatemala. Either we cut it off or Congress will cut it off uh, while screaming at us for human rights abuses. So why is that smart? We should cut it off, and then we'll get kudos for... And people went around the room and sort of said, yeah, 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 I guess that's right. So Schultz takes over in the... Summer of 82, as Secretary of State. How does that change your life? Well, first of all, let's, we'll talk about human rights policy, but in general, how do what, you're Assistant Secretary of State, and there's a new Secretary of State. What, what's that like? Well, I, I didn't know Schultz at all. You know, he was sort of helicoptered in, <clears throat> though he had, a, obviously, a great career before that, a cabinet member. Um, and I met him as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and, you know, was just hoping. I mean, it was perfectly plausible that he would want somebody else in that position. Right. <clears throat> but um, we got on well. Um, and he really appreciated what was being done. And the test of it, interestingly, and it was more of a test later, uh, the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. That was a test because Schultz had been dean of the Graduate School of Economics or the Business School at the University of Chicago. He had trained a lot of the uh, economists who were doing a fabulous job, fabulous job in Chile. <clears throat> and he was very admiring of the job they were doing. But uh, there were a lot of human rights abuses. And when I went to him with them and said, we have to protest this publicly, we have to condemn this, <clears throat> he would shake his head. Reluctantly, we have to do it, but yes, we would do it. Um, and he was, as he looked around the world, at, uh, you know, it's easy to be against the Castro dictatorship and Cuba communist dictatorships and things like that. Um, but he was sympathetic with the view that a human rights policy, to be credible, meant that if you think back to those days that you had to be critical of the apartheid government of South Africa and of the generals in South Korea and of the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines. And one could go on. There were an awful lot of military dictatorships in those days. Um, so Schultz, Schultz was really 100% behind this human rights policy. And it changed life in the Human Rights Bureau a lot. It meant <clears throat> that if I went to the Assistant Secretary for Asia, Africa, Latin America, and said, we need to do this, we need to say this, they could not say, go home. Because I had the ability to elevate the dispute to the Secretary, and I might win. That meant they had to bargain with me, and they did. And therefore, the Bureau actually became a bit of a player. So you're Assistant Secretary for Human Rights. Human rights becomes a theme of the Reagan administration. And then in the, is it the beginning of the second term, you're asked to move over to become Assistant Secretary for Latin America? Yes, it was, let's see, 1985. Right. Um, I think I was sworn in in July 1985. So now you're in charge of one of these powerful dukedoms <laughs> that actually controls a whole region of the world. and. People forget today, but a region that was extremely important in yes. the Reagan administration because of the fights against communism in Central America. Uh, yes, I mean, there was concern, first of all, about stability in Mexico. 
<clears throat> there were all these military dictatorships that we really did want to get rid of, and there was this battle in Central America. Um, and for that matter, one should add Grenada. Um, people forget there was actually American military action there. Furthermore, there was Noriega in Panama that ultimately led in the year after Reagan, George H.W. Bush, another invasion. So it's a real hot spot. For me, it was a huge difference because, as you just put it, you're really running these things. I, I think the number was 38 embassies. The ambassador's reporting to me. Um, I, I would say I was very fortunate that I did this in my fifth year in the State Department because had I been tossed into this, um, in the beginning, I would not have known what, how to do it. Um, but after four years of watching and being in the, in the building, <clears throat> I thought I knew how to run a bureau. Um, but you have much more power. For example, personnel power. Um, you have the ability to say, you know, uh, Jane should be ambassador to Peru, not John. Who changes people's lives and changes the foreign policy of, of the president because a lot does depend, even now, on, on uh, an ambassador. So <clears throat> it made me a, um, a bigger shot in the building, that's for sure. And we were, you know, we were on the front pages an awful lot in those days. And I'm just curious, on the managerial side, you've got a whole bunch of foreign service officers, career civil servants, a few political appointees, I guess, but fewer than people think, I, th I think. Is that right? How much of a challenge just is it to make your own bureau do what you want it to do, and what the secretary wants it to do? You're right. It was very few. I mean, as I remember, I think I had four political appointees in a bureau of about 250 people in Washington, and then all the embassies and their staffs. <coughs> Sorry. My... In only one case, well, two cases, I think, would I say there was a kind of rebellion by Foreign Service officers who were just not following the President's policy. For the rest, my thought, and, and comparing notes with other regional assistant secretaries, I think this is really a fair thing to say. If you make the policy clear, the Foreign Service officers will generally follow you. If they think there is strong leadership, that will, among other things, protect them, by the way, because there will be criticism. And as long as it is possible to, for a Foreign Service officer to say, <clears throat> I don't make the policy. The president makes it, Schultz makes it, Abrams makes it, uh, I'm just carrying it out as best I can, they will carry it out. Um, and I found, you know, if you brought them in and said, look, here's what the president wants, how can we do that? Schultz was particularly good about this. Haig, you, you know, why did Haig lose his job after a year and a half? Because he was fighting the White House. Um, I was shocked sometimes when I would have conversations with him alone <clears throat> at the insults he would throw at the White House and the people there. Because, you know, after all, I was at this point 33 years old and he didn't know me very well and he shouldn't be saying this to me. Um, Schultz, is, Schultz used to say, if you were at a meeting, say somebody would say that policies just awful. What is the president doing? This is completely wrong. This is not going to work for the following 12 reasons. Schultz would listen. He was a great listener. He would hear you out. And then he would say, usually, you know, you may be right. You may be right. What you need to do is to get elected president. <laughs> but since Ronald Reagan is president, we're going to do what he wants to do. And there was never a, you know, a sort of sense of rebellion at the White House. Schultz would push back, but the way he would push back was face to face with the president. <clears throat> there was a, um, a moment, it's actually, uh, the documents are out when the president, we're talking about Pinochet in Chile, and the, and the president said, well, maybe we should get Pinochet here and I'll talk to him about human rights. Just think about having this fascist dictator. To, and Schultz at this NSC meeting responded to the president, no way, no way. So he would push back, but he would do it the way you push back loyally, which is face-to-face. -face. Um, so uh, I ran this bureau. I, I should actually tell this story because, you know, Schultz took a risk, right, when he appoints this young guy. He was still pretty young to be an assistant secretary, particularly a regional one. There was an earthquake in 1985 in Mexico City, huge earthquake. And um, I'd never handled a natural disaster before. And I didn't know, you know, what does an assistant secretary say have to do with a natural disaster? So there was a dinner that night, some black tie dinner. I went to it, and there was a team being formed at the State Department to uh, handle this. And 
I get beeped. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. We right, had beepers. Right. The secretary wants to talk to me. So I call in, and he says, you're on top of this, aren't you? Um, <laughs> uh, sure. I uh, Yes. And he said, all right, well, just make, you know, make sure you are. And I thought, oh, geez. So I say my goodbyes at this dinner, and I rush back to the department. It's around 11.30 or something like that at night. Uh, the assistant secretary arrives, me. There's this big uh, operation center set up. I mean, the State Department knows how to do this. They've dealt with earthquakes before. They give me a full briefing for like 20 minutes, go all the way around this huge room. Uh, these are the people trying to get communications. These are the people dealing with hospitals. These are the people. Um, at midnight, the Schultzes arrive, the secretary and Mrs. Schultz. He was at a different black tie dinner. And what happens? The new, the young assistant secretary is, greets the secretary, and he says, what's going on? So, of course, I regurgitate. I take him around the room, right. and I tell him, okay, this is what we're doing here. This is the communications. These are the hospitals. This is this. This is this. It made a big impression on him, clearly, yeah. that, you know, here's this young, oh, he's really, this guy's good. He's really in charge. I don't know. I, I suppose the lesson here is there's no substitute for luck. Because right. if he showed up and I not showed up, God knows what his impression he would have formed of me. But in any event, it, uh, it, it helped. Um, being a regional assistant secretary is different um, in that way. And also, of course, as we found out in Iran-Contra, in that you know, the buck has to stop someplace, and one of the places it stops is with you. Tell me a little bit about people I think are very curious, and I am, even not having worked in the State Department. If you're Assistant Secretary of State, how often do you deal with the Secretary of State, A, and B, what is it like dealing with the White House, the Defense Department, all the other agencies? It's a, comp it's a complex job to have. You're reporting up, you're working yep. sideways with the other agencies as, that are part of the same administration, and then God knows there's Congress and the media and foreign governments and everyone else you have to deal with. I mean... Yeah, uh, this is a very good description. <clears throat> One of the key tasks is to figure out what is assistant secretarial, if I can put it th that way. Because if you take everything that comes before you to the secretary, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Uh, of course, he doesn't have time for this. Uh, he's got too much to look at. But if you don't go to him, then you run a different risk. Uh, Pat Buchanan, the columnist, uh, did a very, very tough pro Nicaraguan Contra editorial one day, I think it was in the Washington Post, almost accusing the opponents of aid to the Contras of disloyalty. Um, and it infuriated Schultz. And I remember him saying at a, uh, when it, he called me to his Buchanan office. was then in the White House. Buchanan was in yeah, the White House. So it's guy. a yeah. White House. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, and he, Schultz called me in and said, how did this get in the Washington Post? Who approved this? And the answer was me. Um, so I said, well, I approved it. And there was a kind of silence for a moment, and then Schultz said, you approved it. Well, why would you have asked me? I mean, I'm just Secretary of State. <laughs> so there was an error in figuring out what was secretarial and what was assistant secretarial. But that's a critical thing. Uh, you know, I, I think different assistant secretaries are going to have a different method here. It's, one thing is, is sure, staff is critical. You cannot do it all yourself. So uh, you need to be reacting with, liaising with, whatever is the right word, uh, the military, uh, the U.S. military, both the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Uniform Military, and the CIA, and the White House, of course, and the Congress, constantly. The uh, State Department doesn't have a good institutional relationship with uh, Congress, so you have to build it yourself. Each team has to build its own. Um, and with the White House, it's the NSC, and the question is, Who's there and what's, you know, what's, um, we didn't have a good relationship. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I learned in Washington is that where you stand does depend on where you sit. Because one of the critical things I thought I had to do as Assistant Secretary of State was keep the NSC Latin America staff from knowing or doing almost anything. Then, of course, when I was on the NSC staff, in that case, being the Middle East, I thought, well, you know, this is the president's policy and we need to make sure the president, and who, who they, who cares what the State Department thinks? So, um, but, in, but under Reagan, I think Schultz was such a strong Secretary of State that you guys did dominate policy. Is that not right? I mean, uh, it is right, um, and it is because Schultz was first of all he was a great executive. You know, he'd been Secretary of Labor, he'd been um, Secretary OMB of the Treasury, director. yeah, a Bureau of the Budget in those days. He knew how to run a, an agency. 
Uh, he was, you know, extremely smart, and he managed personally his relationship with the president, and no small matter, Mrs. Reagan, um, so that it was always close. And he managed his relationship with, you know, the White House Chief of Staff. Um, and so how much did someone like you deal directly with the president or the White House Chief of Staff? Um, not too much. I mean, he, I would go with him to National Security Council meetings. Go with Schultz. Too. I would go with Schultz. <coughs> if and it was that dealing with Latin America. Or right. And, yeah. Or if I Central would see the America. president when, you know, the president of Brazil visits, the president of Honduras visits, then we would have a meeting in the Oval Office, then we would have lunch, so I'd be with the president then. When I was nominated, as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, I only met the president in, you know, gatherings of 200 people or something. When I was nominated for uh, Assistant Secretary for Latin America, uh, we had a briefing of the president, some, you know, Latin American president was coming and they included me in. And I remember Schultz introducing me and saying, uh, Mr. President, you know, this is Elliot Abrams and turning me and saying, Elliot, you know the president. And I thought, actually, I don't know the president, but it's a nice introduction. Now I know the president. Um, I would see him only on those occasions, plus a few others. For example, I remember once uh, making what we called a kind of fact-finding trip uh, to El Salvador um, and then returned to the Oval Office to make a report to president and what I'd seen. Um, later, when I was a member of the White House staff in the Bush administration, it was much more uh, constant. But as, as an assistant secretary in those days, I, I imagine I saw the president only about once a month. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Uh, it's so different from being on the White House staff, where you really yes. do yes. work for the president. I mean, through the National Security Advisor, right? But right. I mean, the difference is, of course, <clears throat> I would see Powell, uh, Powell. I, I would see um, Secretary Schultz all the time. Right. Um, at, when Powell was Secretary of State, I was on the White House staff. I wouldn't see him all the time. But, for example, was, well, we had a morning staff meeting. So there was a morning staff meeting that the Secretary personally ran? Secretary personally ran. So for with all the assistant secretaries senior of staff, state? Right. Senior I would staff. say 25 people, roughly. All the, there was one deputy. There were three or four undersecretaries. There were, I don't know, 15 assistant secretaries of one kind or another. Um, and we would meet, if the Secretary wasn't traveling, we would meet with him every day. And then in addition to that, you know, you could ask to see him about um, a particular issue or problem you had. And then there were visitors. You know, again, these people were right. coming in. And not only would you be with him when he saw, in my case, the Latin American president, but if a foreign minister was coming, that foreign minister would not see our president. They would see their counterpart, the Secretary of State. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, I guess I did average about once a day with uh, Secretary Schultz. And I'm just curious, because people always ask me this too, and so, and you're dealing with foreign governments, so what, if you're the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, and you have an issue with Guatemala or Chile or any place, do you go through the ambassador? Do you personally call up the foreign minister of Chile? Yeah. How does that work? Well, because it's the United States, to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, to be the senior official for Latin America, is a very big deal. You know, to be, to be the Assistant Secretary assistant minister, you know, for Latin America of, I don't know, Peru is a little bit different, but for America, um, I certainly dealt with foreign ministers. Um, when I would visit those countries, I would see them and the president. And, he, in, uh, and not just in, if you'll pardon the expression, dinky little country. I mean, if I went to Brazil, I would see the president of Brazil. Right. Um, I would not, the instructions to the um, U.S. embassies this is a technology question. We didn't have email. Uh, we had secure phones, and they were awful. Right. And they were almost a comedy routine of screaming into the phone to try to be heard. You lose the conversation halfway through. Um, so uh, cables were critically important. Um, nowadays, it is much, much easier to, for an assistant secretary to give an instruction by secure phone or by <clears throat> unsecure or secure email and kind of run your little empire that way. I would be in touch with um, our ambassadors frequently. Um, they would visit Washington several times a year. I traveled a lot in the region. My deputies, you know, I had a deputy for Central America, a deputy for South America, a deputy for the Caribbean, were going out. So there was, um, there was a lot of interchange. There was a fight that was sort of famous, that there dispute, I guess, debate, among conservatives, you were sort of the leader of one camp. I think Jesse Helms, the senator from North Carolina, uh, a conservative hero at the time and subsequently, 
was a leader of the other on how to deal with, I guess, human rights concerns in friendly dictatorships, but I think particularly with Chile, as, as I recall, in Pinochet. <coughs> I'd, I'd be, I'm, I, I vaguely remember it, but I mean, it was an interesting no, moment, I think. And it's, it's true. You know, <coughs> one, would, one should connect this with <coughs> the conservative critique of Carter policy, the loss of Iran and, in this region, Nicaragua. Um, and this was a view that Gene Kirkpatrick largely shared. It was the totalitarian authoritarian distinction. The view was we can work with authoritarian dictators who are basically pro-Western, and we can make them improve, uh, but if a place goes totalitarian, it's there forever, and we should prevent that, because that meant it would be allied with the Soviet Union, and we're in the height of the Cold War here. Um, you know, I thought there was a lot to that, although in retrospect, one has to say that, of course, even the totalitarian Soviet Union turned out not to right. be invincible, but we thought, I would say, I thought, Schultz thought, that the answer is not, uh, th therefore, to support any authoritarian dictator who's pro-American. It is, rather, to try to figure out how to support moderate pro-American centrists as the alternative. We thought that that kind of authoritarian right-wing government with tremendous human rights abuses was a gift to the communists. And it was critically important for the Reagan administration to take this view, because what were they saying, these guys? It's mere communism. So for Ronald Reagan to say, no, actually it isn't. Nobody's more anti-communist than I am, but you could be leading down the path to communism because people are going to be so um, angered and offended by the human rights abuses. Uh, in, the, in the case of, of Chile, we thought, Schultz, the State Department, What's going to happen if Pinochet falls? I mean, Pinochet having taken over, what, in 73, I guess, yeah. and having been very successful economically it, it's an and, economic and a great miracle. ally of the U.S. Uh, but an increasingly uh, brutal dictator. Um, and the feeling that Senator Helms had was it'll be a communist dictatorship. If Pinochet were if to fall. If Pinochet yeah. falls. Well, yeah. He's going to be, look, don't you learn anything from Nicaragua? Our view was we know what comes after Pinochet. The Christian Democrats. And, uh, you know, name names. We could name names because these were people who visited us in the State Department. I saw every one of them. Schultz would some kind, sometimes come down to my office and see others of them there, and socialists as well. We thought these are Democrats and they're not communists, they're not pro Soviet. Um, and in the end, it, it came to actually a crunch when, because Pinochet was supposed to have. Um, at the end of the Reagan administration, 1988, a referendum on whether <coughs> he continued in office. And um, it looked as if he might lose it, so he didn't want to hold it. There was a lot of Reagan administration pressure to hold it. And in the last days of that referendum, Pinochet wanted to scrap it or declare martial law because he saw he was going to lose. And not only did we tell him don't do that, we told him uh, and we told the Chilean military, going around him, to the Air Force and the Navy. And we went through the British to do this as well, because they had you know, 100 years of ties to the Chilean Navy. You will lose all Western support. You will be a pariah state. Don't let Pinochet do it. And Pinochet actually had, on that fateful night, it's very dramatic, make a great movie, and it was made into a great movie, actually. Um, he had the military. Uh, leaders, head of the Air Force, head of the police, uh, in the presidential palace and said, we're going to do this, we're going to declare martial law, and they said no. And I do believe that one of the reasons they rebuffed him was the pressure from the Reagan administration. Don't do this. And how much trouble did you have getting conservatives in the U.S., in the Senate, in the House, to support you, or enough of them to support you that you didn't have a big rebellion on your hands? I mean, President Reagan was, was fine with this policy? Uh, and President Reagan had to be persuaded by Secretary Schultz that we all along, we know what we're doing here. This is not a policy that will work for 100 countries. It'll work for Chile. And, and the President, I think, certainly by the end, I mean, first of all, he was fully briefed all along. <clears throat> when it came to um, scrapping this referendum that had been promised and essentially destroying the rule of law in Chile, the President was 100% on board. This cannot be permitted to happen. Just as he is the person who sent uh, uh, one of his closest friends, Senator Paul Laxalt, then to see the dictator Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines to say, times 
up. So the president um, had to be persuaded that this was not going to lead to another one of these, the dictator falls but a communist dictator takes over. Um, I don't think we had, as I recall it, a huge conservative rebellion on this. Uh, we had alarm, concern, and we had Senator Helm, who was never persuaded, and Secretary Kissinger, of course then long out of office, but was never persuaded and was, was quite worried and thought the communists are next. But, you know, w what got us a lot of confidence, I think, was the sense, again, it's not going to do anything that's going to lead to a communist takeover of any country. And we're in the period now when we're fighting a communist takeover in Central America. So we had a tremendous amount of credibility on this. I mean, it is amazing in Reagan's second term, people forget, that, I mean, obviously he laid the groundwork for the collapse of the Soviet Union. You, you fought the communists in Central America, and Nicaragua, and El Salvador. But also the transitions from dictatorship to democracy among our allies were pretty startling and pretty fundamental, no? I mean, yeah. Philippines, South Korea, South Chile, Africa. South Africa, uh, big Chile, countries. Chile, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, um, uh, Central America. The, the progress was really quite extraordinary, and we supported it. And in some cases, I think Chile is one, and, and as I have said, the Philippines is clearly another. The presidential pressure was critical. And I do think that changes American, the history of American conservatism and American foreign policy in the sense that really subsequently to that, I'd say subsequent to 1988, even though not every participant in either the first Bush administration or the second Bush administration was fully on board the, this kind of democracy doctrine, that really was kind of at the heart of uh, America, well, American foreign policy generally probably, but certainly Republican and conservative foreign policy thinking. And that's a pretty big transition, because as you say, in the early 80s, People were very <coughs> skeptical of human rights and very much thinking, you know, look, the democracy stuff is very risky and look what we talked about it in Iran and look what happened, et cetera. Yeah, it's an underreported, <coughs> it seems to me, side of, you know, what, well, what happened. Yeah, it's underreported because people on the left don't want to give Reagan credit for this. Right. So they don't give Reagan credit for this. Um, but uh, another piece of this, I think it's worth saying again, is we didn't do this human rights policy as casework. It wasn't about getting three guys out of jail because they can put them in jail faster than you can get them out. It was about systemic change, and the ultimate case, of course, is the Soviet Union, which then collapses early in the George H.W. Bush administration. So Reagan's second term, I think, great success, historians will think, and we all thought so at the time. The fall of communism is imminent, democracy and uh, the defeat of the communists in Central America, uh, the rise of democracy in Latin America, and really Asia. People forget how stunning an achievement that is, South Korea, the yep. Philippines. Uh, Taiwan, and then of course the yep. big countries in Latin America, I guess marred really by the Iran-Contra scandal, yes. which you would get unfairly dragged into. What was that like, and uh, any reflections on that? I mean, no reflections on it. Well, <clears throat> it certainly cemented my loyalty to the Republican Party, which I had only been a member of at that point for you know a few years, a couple of years. Um, Scandals are a thing that happens in Washington, and it's hard to explain to somebody who's coming to Washington, you know, at out of law school or grad school or something. Um, Pat Moynihan always used to have the Washington Post rule, that is, don't do anything that you wouldn't want to see written up on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, so this was a huge scandal, you know, which um, it had a lot of Democrats saying, impeach, 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 um, and had select committees and had uh, criminal convictions. And I mean, it was by any standard a major, major scandal. And it was for me, um, and my family, it was awful, I mean, to go through this, uh, to read the things that people are saying about you, to face the possibility that you're going to be prosecuted. You're, people, are, people are trying to send you to jail. I mean, that's the thing and that not is... not for anything you had done in office, right, but for testimony to Congress <coughs> that you had willingly right. given. Right. And truthfully uh, given as far as you realized at the yes. time, I used to think. <coughs> <coughs> One of the things that happens is, of course, fairness goes out the window. Um, to a certain extent, law goes out the window because uh, I was finding, for example, that I would go testify in secret and everything I said would be made available to the press immediately thereafter as if people were running out instantly calling reporters. <clears throat> Why? Because there was partisan advantage against a president who was otherwise very popular. Um, that's a, that is a crime, by the way, that's classified information. So um, the rules are, <clears throat> pardon me, in suspension. Um, and it's, it's awful. There is a sense of every man for himself now, and will the president protect you or will he protect himself? And, and uh, you know, does, does the White House uh, 
are they going to back you or would they rather that you leave? And, and so let me, you know, <clears throat> put it this way. You sure find out who your friends are uh, very quickly in a situation like that. Um, I have often been asked, sometimes in law schools, <clears throat> do you have any advice about uh, this? And I answer sort of half-jokingly, but only half. Don't take any notes. I had elaborate notes of uh, <clears throat> in a little notebook of all the meetings and so forth that I had attended, which was immediately seized by the prosecutors, <clears throat> lawfully or not, I don't know. But um, I didn't have a notebook like that in the Bush administration um, because it can be turned against you. So uh, it's an awful experience, and I don't. I'm not so sure that there's any way of preparing somebody for it, except um, you really have to have a strong marriage, is the thing I'll say. Because, you know, there are moments when you feel quite alone. Um, and you're not sure of, you know, the guy in the next office or the guy in the Oval Office. Um, so you better be sure of your, of your home. Good, good advice, good advice. So you survived that. You're out of office for the Bush administration, as many Reaganites were. Um, yeah. the, for all the continuity of Vice President Bush taking over, there was a certain sense, I think, of changing the page. Secretary Baker comes in. I don't think he keeps anyone really from the no, State, State and, Department. And, you know, I think almost every president thinks that his predecessor and the predecessor team were a bunch of morons. <laughs> and it, party doesn't matter, really. I right. mean, as, as we found out in the George H.W. Bush case, just get those people out of here. So you're out and you run a think tank and you write books and then you come back in. So let's talk about the your eight years. I think it's almost the entire George W. Bush administration. Isn't uh, that right? Yes. I was in, in from the first day to actually not the first day. It was a couple of months. Uh, oddly enough, I was at this point, I was the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which I had been put on, at, I think, 1999. Um, which and is a part-time. It's a part-time thing, right, right, unpaid and so forth. And and um, as chairman, I went to see the new Secretary of State, Colin Powell, whom I'd known from Reagan years, and Condoleezza Rice, whom I'd never met, who was now a National Security Advisor. Um, and both of them, after we got finished talking about international religious freedom, offered me a job. And I took the White House job because, you know, I'd spent eight years at the State Department. And I thought, this will be new and exciting. How can you turn down the White House, you know? So this so is the I National see, yes. Security Council, just to be clear to people. And Condi Rice is the National Security Advisor, and she has a, sta a team of, what, 70 people? Oh, it's you know? probably more than that. You know, uh, they're hidden people. on different payrolls as right. in every administration. Yeah, 150 maybe is and probably And you work closer. in the White House <clears throat> or next door to the White House, in the, but in the White House complex. Well, she hired me. Um, the job that was uh, vacant and then they could not seem to find anybody they liked to fill was um, special assistant to the president, and Senior Director of the National Security Council for Democracy, Human Rights, and International Organizations. So, of course, they looked at me and said, Democracy, Human Rights, this That's guy did this did, stuff, right? so let's hire him. So, yeah, your office is in the executive office building right across that little alleyway from the White House. Um, and I'd never worked in the White House before. Of course, it's very different because it's not a bureaucracy. That's the thing. <clears throat> if you think back to being Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, you have four or five deputies. You have a couple of hundred people working for you in the building. You have 38 embassies. It's a bureaucracy. Uh, they're, they were there before you. They're going to be there after you. At the NSC, you work for the president and the National Security Advisor. There's nothing bureaucratic about it. They want to hire you. You're hired the next day. Um, and it's very personal. <clears throat> what does the president want? We have to protect the president. We want to know what the president's policy should be. And who are we protecting him from? Well, in no small part, the State Department. I mean, it's also the press, the Democrats, the Hill, um, and the other agencies. I mean, state, defense, CIA, all of which have their own institutional interests. And the greatest mistake you could make would be to assume that all of them, you know, on January 20th, the new president comes in, and everybody is now going to do what he says. They know what he wants. They know what he means. And they'll follow that path. This is not true. And the purpose of the NSC staff really is to guide this huge uh, uh, bureaucratic structuring. What are we talking about here? We're talking about millions, literally, if you count the uniform military, millions of people on a federal payroll and shepherd them into doing what the president wants done. And it's always struck me, it's just a few dozen or 150 or something people trying to <clears throat> guide this, as you say, this massive structure with persuasion and 
some ability, I suppose, to crack the whip, but a lot of it is persuasion, right? I mean, you don't have line authority over the Assistant Secretary of Defense for this or that or... Well, the significant, you're absolutely right. You have line authority over nothing. Your own nothing. staff, right? Yeah, I mean, I had, in that particular job, I had uh, <coughs> three people working for me. Later, in the more significant job of uh, Special Assistant Senior Director for the Near East, I had we went up to four people working for me. Yeah, so just quickly say, so what job, you, jobs did you have in the White House? You first your senior director for democracy, et cetera, and then you take right. over the Middle and, East. And the then that was for two years, and then the second two years I took over the directorate of Middle Eastern Affairs called Near East and North Africa, and then in the second term was elevated to be a, a, a deputy assistant to the president, deputy national security advisor, with supervision over both of the directorates I had previously led, democracy, human rights, UN affairs one and the, the Near East one. And there, you know, for example, um, now with the technology, I have the ability to call secure or email secure any U.S. ambassador and give him instructions. But of course, I'm not allowed to do that. Instructions come only from the State Department. The mo what I could do and did do would be to write an email to an ambassador, let's say Ambassador Tunisia, copy the Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East and say to the ambassador, I really would like you to do X. Obviously, you don't take instructions from me, you take them from the State Department, but I would hope you would get that instruction from them. And then, usually, fortunately, the Assistant Secretary, you know, feeling a little bit of pressure here, would, <clears throat> would send a follow-up email saying, yeah, Joe, that's a good idea, why don't you do that? Now, of course, on the phone, he may have said to the ambassador, these idiots at the White House, what are they doing? Let's play along. But it is mostly cajoling, persuading, arguing, and again, there's the elevation question. That is, there is the sense, you know, if they say no, drop dead. There's always the chance that the National Security Advisor raises it to the Secretary or that you go to the President. And I'll give you an example. Um, <coughs> David Petraeus, <coughs> he was the um, uh, U.S. military leader in Iraq, and there were lots of jihadis coming into Iraq from Syria. Uh, Petraeus wanted to go to Syria. He wanted to go to Damascus and see Assad. What, I thought this was a crazy idea, a horrible idea. I blocked it, I delayed it as much as I could. Well, you know, why don't we wait till after Christmas? Or, you know, there's an NSC meeting in two weeks, why don't we wait until after that meeting? Or, well, there's legend. Finally, of course, you know, you can't delay it, and I, what, I can't give instructions to David Petraeus. So he said, I'm going. And it is at that point that Steve Hadley, second term national security advisor, actually took the issue at my request to the president. He said, General Petraeus wants to go to Damascus. And the president instantly said, what? No four-star general of mine is going to meet that butcher. So uh, no trip. And one of the lessons here is one of the things you need to do is you need to know your president. Because if you're pushing a line and you're pushing hard and you're pushing generals and you're pushing people in the State Department, they, you need to know that you're going to get back up from the Oval Office, and they need to know it too. They'll steamroller you unless they think, well, you know, this guy, not so dumb. He probably has the president behind him. So you, you, you got to, or else you're useless. But I want to get to the substance, obviously, of Middle East policy, which was so important under President Bush, where you played such a key role in, and have written a very interesting book about. But let's talk a little more about the bureaucratic fights and the sort of how it works in the White House. So you would, when you come in, you're working for Condoleezza Rice, and you hadn't really known before much. <clears throat> right, one phone call. And right. George W. Bush, whom you didn't know at all, presumably. I'd never met George W. Bush. I'd never spoken to George w. I'd never been in the same room with George <laughs> W. Bush <coughs> until a meeting, <clears throat> the first meeting I attended was actually about immigration policy. It was a meeting in the Oval Office. I was invited. Um, God knows why, but I was. And um, I was, two things happened of interest to me. One, he recognized me, um, which wasn't you know, necessarily the case. I walked in, he said, very glad to have you on board, which of course say, made my day was an understatement. <clears throat> this is in the first year of the administration. It's probably the summer of 2001. And there were a lot of news stories about how Cheney's really running everything and he's really the prime minister. And, and I was shocked by this meeting because I, well, why would I not believe that? It was in the newspapers, right? right, right. Uh, there was nobody else in the room of importance except the president. There was Condoleezza Rice, there was Dick Cheney, there was the attorney general, there was the the uh, secretary of this and the secretary of that, didn't matter. Uh, the attorney general started out saying, the meeting saying, Mr. President, we're here to boom, there came Bush. I want to do this, I want to do that, I don't care about this, I do care about it. 
so totally in charge that it, you know, blew away any notion that this was anything but George W. Bush's administration. And this is before 2000. 9-11-2001 also. Let me ask about 9-11 for a second and then get back to it. I would love to hear more stories about the working with President Bush, which you did especially, I guess, after you be, were right. put in charge of the Middle East. 9-11, right. um, you were there? I was there. I was in the executive office building and, and uh, we had, just as Schultz had a morning staff meeting when he was Secretary of State, Condi Rice had a morning staff meeting as a National Security Advisor every day at 8, if I remember. And so uh, I get up out of my office. You know, it's a four-minute walk from the executive office building, and as I'm leaving, one of the four staff people I had says to me, look at this, points to a little TV we had, some idiot crashed into the World Trade Center. I thought, yeah, I've seen that movie, right, in the 1930s, Empire State Building. Right. We go to the uh, situation room in the basement of the White House, and- That's where the normal staff meeting NSC every morning. staff meeting are. Yeah. And Condi starts the meeting, as usual, we go around the room, you know, there's a UN vote on this, there's a, President of Bolivia wants Wasn't to visit. something happening the next day? I seem to remember the president was going to give a speech or something. Uh, the president the was going to the United Nations. Right. This was his first year as president and his first speech to the General Assembly, 9 12, 2001. And you would have had some responsibility yes, for this. Yes, for the speech. So. And we were going to go up in the morning. You know, <clears throat> Air Force One goes to New York and um, everything was all, this is all sort of set in motion. <clears throat> and a few minutes into the meeting, Somebody comes in, hands uh, Condi Rice a note. It happened once in a while. The president wants to see you or something. And um, she opened the note and said, she didn't remember this. I told her this later. You are dismissed and got up and left the room. Now, Condi's the most courteous person in the entire world. And for her to say, you were dismissed, we all thought, what the hell is going on? We go back to the office. And I was in the office for about a second when um, the second plane hits. And... Um, then the Secret Service told us, get out of the building, because we thought the plane that ultimately was brought down in Pennsylvania might well be going for the White House. And what is striking in my memory is we had fire drills all the time. The Secret Service guys, when we reached the ground floor, were saying, run, get out of here, run out of here, run. My secretary, who had, was a CIA career secretary, quit. She said, I don't want to work for a place like this anymore. I can't take this kind of danger and pressure. Um, so not so long after, she said, I'm done. But <clears throat> it was very memorable. When the Secret Service guys are telling you, don't walk, run out of here. And for several days after that, uh, the access to the White House was extremely difficult. And there were, you know, all the way up Pennsylvania Avenue, there were, there were checkpoints, and then another checkpoint, and then another checkpoint. Um, but uh, it was you know, obviously uh, a day that changed not only the country, but for our little world, it changed the administration. And you knew right away this was going to be, I mean, it changed everything, right? It changed everything. I mean, you could see it. All you had to do was watch the president's interviews. Uh, the president in New York in the famous incident with the bullhorn and the president right. at Yankee Stadium. And, um, and if you were dealing with him face to face, it was also true. Uh, you know, there were kind of two administrations, pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And the Middle East becomes awfully important post 9-11, and then you have responsibility for the Middle East. So. It does. I mean, I didn't for the first two years. I was in this other position. But you I, still had some influence because the democracy, international organization portfolio I, I did. dealt with so much. Right. In, in fact, in my life, it is a bizarre replication of what happened in the State Department, where I didn't have the area expertise, but I was doing a lot because of human rights with Latin America, so Schultz turned to me. Uh, same thing happened with Condi when the person doing this left. I had talked to her a lot about human rights and democracy in the Middle East. And some, I had talked to her about actual, what you might call, Middle East policy. So she invites me to take this job, which I was happy to do, December 2002. After that, I had, of course, more exposure to her and a lot more exposure to the president. So say a little bit about the substance of the policy. I mean, Bush's Middle East policy was different from his predecessors and I guess his successor. <laughs> and you know, how did you all decide that? Was that who drove that? Was that him? Was that Condi? Was it the world? Uh, it's George W. Bush in a number of ways. One of them is, is human rights. Uh, Bush tries to explain to himself after 9-11, <coughs> what happened? Why do nine Saudis drive planes into the World Trade Center? Um, and there was a handy explanation that did, in fact, begin to come over from the State Department. They hate us because we support Israel. That's why they hate us. So if we were to distance ourselves from Israel, well, this kind of thing wouldn't happen. He rejects that. 
He rejects it completely because he notices that what concerned these Saudis, indeed what, what's Bin Laden writing about, Mecca, Medina, Riyadh, Jeddah, he's talking about Saudi Arabia. So Bush, Bush has a pro-Israel policy, and 9-11 actually cements that policy rather than destroying it. He also has a pro-democracy policy. Though the administration is not entirely, the rest of the administration does not exactly get cemented into that. Is that not right? Yeah, that's right. The State Department never truly buys in, and Bush in his memoirs says he often thought the State Department was pursuing a different line. <clears throat> I actually think that Powell never adjusted to 9-11 and that his star began to wane and even as early as 2002 and by 2003 Condi is in charge of Middle East policy. Um, we have a couple of summit meetings in the Middle East in 2003. She does everything. She does all the preparations. We on the White House staff do all the preparations. Powell is in truth, though he's of course doesn't look that way in the pictures, he's a marginal figure to this. Um, Bush also came to believe after 9-11 uh, <coughs> what people are, are concerned about, what they're fighting about, what they're bitter about, what they're committing acts of terrorism about, comes from the closed nature of their Arab societies. Uh, no political freedom, no economic freedom, no social mobility. Um, and so this leads him to a series of speeches, one of them being the second inaugural, about the expansion of freedom in the Middle East. He isn't the only source of this. It is in the air in the Middle East, but I think that he I think that historically he will, certainly if people are fair, get a lot of credit for helping expand this idea that that's what's wrong uh, in the Arab world, not the American support for Israel, which of course gets closer partly because now we're both in the front line of the war against terror. We're both fighting terror. And on that basis, Bush, who did not have a close relationship with Ariel Sharon, the Israeli prime minister then, forges that relationship. So tell, I think people will be very interested. I'm interested in hearing about that in more detail. I mean, how does that work? So there you are, you're running the Middle East policy. President Bush says, wants to be a strong supporter of Israel. He also wants to have changes happen in the Arab world. He's also fighting a war in Iraq and elsewhere, which other countries in the region have opinions about, and we need their support and all that. And there's a lot of pressure, I'm sure, to keep the peace <coughs> process going. And so Sharon Char yeah. is already prime minister of Israel. Yes. Uh, Sharon became prime minister essentially when Bush uh, became Becomes president. Um, and so do they get along right away or not particularly? They or? didn't get along very well right away. Um, there's a generational gap for one thing. Uh, Sharon is literally a generation older. Sharon's English was not great. Um, Condi Rice had the brilliant phrase one time that Sharon was the only person she had ever met who spoke English better than he understood it. <laughs> that may seem impossible, but she was right, meaning that he spoke it in kind of catchphrases that he knew. You tell me the subject, terrorism, settlements, Palestinians, Egypt. He knew what he wanted to say because he'd said it before. But if you were chatting, he might not fully follow. And if you were George Bush and you were chatting in the language called Texan, uh, a lot of colloquialisms, you know, let's, are we going to saddle up, that sort of thing. Right, right. Um, Schultz would often, uh, Schultz, excuse me, um, Sharon would often have to turn to his minister uh, and say, um, what did he say in Hebrew, what, what did he just say? Um, and then uh, the conversation could go forward. And they had some arguments toward the beginning, particularly uh, the president thought sometimes Sharon was going a little bit far in his anti-terrorist activities. He surrounded the Palestinian headquarters, the Mukata in Ramallah and the West Bank, for example, with Israeli troops. Whenever they met, Bush would always say to Sharon when Arafat would come up, because Arafat, Yasser Arafat is at this point still the Palestinian leader until his death in November 2004. The president would always say to Sharon, Ariel, don't kill him, do not kill him, do not, don't you do it. And Sharon would never promise not to do it, he'd kind of shrug or grunt, but in fact he didn't. And after, um, Arafat's death of natural causes. At the next meeting, when, it, when Arafat's name arose, Bush interrupted and said, Ariel, I just want to say, thank you for not killing him. And Sharon replied, sometimes God helps. <laughs> um, so uh, they got along, they got along partly. Sharon saw Bush is absolutely a man of his word. So um, in most cases, for example, when they would conduct an anti-terrorist exercise. And there'd be a lot of criticism, from not only from Arab states, but from Europe. 
and the White House would say, Israel has a right to defend itself. For a long time, by the way, the State Department said, <clears throat> we must stop the cycle of violence, which used to drive me crazy. The cycle of violence is a terrorist act. So they protect themselves. They fight back. What do you mean cycle of violence? Couldn't stop it until 9-11. After 9-11 in Afghanistan, the U.S. invasion, we are fighting. We are hitting. And it was ludicrous to talk about a cycle of violence. We're in it, right? To say that the Israelis should not uh, try to kill Hamas leaders, terrorist leaders, when we're trying, what are we trying desperately to do is kill bin Laden. So uh, finally, we, we managed to uh, assert um, the White House's control of the State Department and say, we're not saying cycle of violence anymore. Sharon appreciated that kind of political, diplomatic, moral support for what he was trying to do. And so Bush is dealing with Sharon, at, but not yes. every day or even every week, presumably. Uh, no, probably every month. Maybe. And you're dealing with your counterpart, I suppose, in the Israeli government, or several right. counterparts. Uh, and that's and it's a close ally which has freedom of action, but on the other hand, we're trying to coordinate. I mean, how it must be almost constant, the communication. <coughs> Condi, uh, in the time that I worked with her, so two years in the NSC and four years when she's Secretary of State, uh, I counted 38 trips to Israel and the West Bank, which is a lot. Um, and that's not counting their visits here, Sharon and others at the top of the Israeli government, civilian and military. And of course, then there's the phone. Technology improves. By the time I'm in the second term, at some point I get a, uh, a secure phone that is internet-based, and I have a button, you know, that's connected to the Prime Minister's office. And I talk to my counterpart, the diplomatic advisor to the Prime Minister, I wouldn't say every day, but probably four times a week. Is that right? Uh, so almost just directly. Every day. Just directly. No State Take Department, up. no ambassador. Right. Right. Uh, right. And uh, it's a sort of <laughs> sensitive this matter. Is, um, right. Look, the relationship, this is, this is true now, I think it's true in every administration. The relationship is between the Prime Minister's office and the White House, the key relationship. The others count. But that's the key relationship. So that, for example, something would happen. I'd push the button, or he would on his end, and, OK, <clears throat> what are we going to say about that event? Or uh, Israel issues a statement. How is the White House going to react to that statement? The closest possible coordination. Yeah, I can't tell you what the people were doing who were handling you know, England or France or something. But um, on Israel, it was really, really close in an effort to smooth things out and be sure that uh, President Bush at one point said, I don't want daylight publicly between the United States and Israel. Anything we have to say, we say privately. Um, and th that's how we managed it. And with your, but there's still tense moments, I'm sure, in the first, even in the first term, <coughs> let alone in the second term, when Condi sure. Rice becomes Secretary of State. And I guess there's a little more tension sometimes with the Israeli government. But even with Sharon there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, people forget, for example, at one point, the Israelis are in the West Bank surrounding Arafat and Rukata. The president gives a public statement in which he says, I want Israel to withdraw from the West Bank now, and when I say now, I mean now. Right. I mean, that's pretty tough language, especially to use toward an ally. Um, <clears throat> uh, he was uh, willing to push back, and, and he did. I remember uh, a meeting, this is 2003, with Sharon, and Sharon two or three times brought up the question of America's commitment to Israeli security. And uh, after about the third time, President Bush said to him, Ariel, if you doubt my commitment to Israeli security, let's just end the meeting now and you can go home. Uh, pretty tough. So uh, not that he wasn't equally tough, by the way. He was with lots of other nations. But he was tough with Sharon. What changed is that um, really we handled Israel out of the White House, particularly in the first term. Once Secretary Rice becomes Secretary of State, a lot of the handling goes over to the State Department. Doesn't change much in 2005 or the beginning of 2006, but after the Lebanon War in the summer of 2006, <coughs> Condi begins to put more pressure on the Israelis, pushing toward a, what she hopes will be a comprehensive negotiated peace settlement with the Palestinians. And then tensions do begin to build. And you're not really on board that State Department initiative, but... I'm not. And so I have a difficult dance. I'm on all these trips. Uh, I'm in all the meetings. And, uh, you know, I owe the president um, honesty and loyalty. And we get into a situation where I'll go to Israel, say, with Condi, or I'll go alone. 
and come back and tell the president, um, there's going to be no comprehensive deal here. Not going to happen. And the president says, well, I just talked to Prime Minister Ulmer. This is after Sharon's stroke forces him out of office. Um, Ulmer's quite optimistic. And Condi tells me she's quite optimistic. And I'm left saying, <clears throat> well, you know, Mr. President, I, all I can do is give you my best judgment here. This is not going to happen. We reached the point where I remember meeting if I, with the uh, foreign minister of Kuwait or the sheikh of Kuwait, where the president was asked by him, is the president optimistic? And I remember the president replying, well, I am somewhat optimistic, and Condi's somewhat optimistic, and, but Elliot's not very <laughs> optimistic. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, that proved to be true. We didn't, we didn't get there. How much of the problem, I was curious if you, if you were reading the newspapers or reading things online every day kind of diligently, how much would one see? I mean, one always hears oh, there's all the secret stuff behind the scenes. You had secret meetings, I think, didn't you? You sure. went incognito to Rome, as I recall, there were meetings well, with Sharon. It wasn't Sharon. incognito, but I, oh, I did go completely unannounced to see Sharon in uh, November 2003. Right, he was on a state visit to, uh, to Italy. It was a great thing because... I mean, it, how does that it, work? It so you suggest that, they suggest that? No, if we, we had a conversation. Issue you guys had to work out? Or? Um, in the spring of 2003, we forced Arafat. Um, we, we had these summit meetings in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, and Aqaba, and we had a new Palestinian prime minister, the guy who later became president, Mahmoud Abbas, and we were, we were really putting um, Arafat in a corner and limiting his power so that we could get a peace negotiation going. Because the president had said, Arab democracy, right? So you want, he didn't want a Palestinian state until and unless it was going to be a democracy, not another corrupt dictatorship. To say nothing of a terrorist state. Right, so you've got to get rid, Arafat had to go. Um, this was a key judgment that George Bush made, which not only do all the Europeans disagree, but remember that the foreigner who made the greatest number of visits to the Clinton White House was not Tony Blair, it was Yasser Arafat. I mean, it's amazing to think of. But we think, after these summit meetings in June 2003, Arafat's in his box, we can move forward. At the end of the summer of 2003, Abbas, the new prime minister, quits, because in fact, Arafat's not in his corner. Arafat is still controlling everything. Um, we're dead in the water. We have no peace policy anymore. Um, the chief of staff of Sharon comes to visit us, and we talk about a meeting with Sharon. Sharon can't come right then. I think it was either he, I think it was he actually, not Condi, who said, okay, <clears throat> why doesn't Elliot come see us in Rome? Because Sharon will be in Rome, the state visit. So I go to Rome, flying under my own name, and I go to the- Commercially, or? Yeah, commercially, I check into some hotel, and uh, walk over, it was close, to the Rome Hilton, which is where Sharon's staying. Some Mossad guy meets me downstairs and escorts me up, you know, back elevators and so forth to his suite. And I'm thinking, this is exciting. He's going to be in the presidential suite. He wants me to have dinner with him. It's going to be the best Italian dinner ever, right? Because Italians are going to want to impress him with. We sit down at the dining room in the suite, formal dining room, and in comes some Mossad guy, because I guess he was the food taster or something, with a plate of cold cuts, literally cold meat to serve Sharon, <laughs> giant slabs of meat. And Sharon, who is a great eater, immediately starts to cut and carve the piece closest to him, which is, by the way, round and pink. <laughs> and I said to myself, I said, we're in Italy, right? There's got to be ham. I don't eat ham. I said, Sharon doesn't eat ham, right? Would he? What? So as he's beginning to chew it, I actually said to him, Prime Minister, what, uh, what meat do you think that is? And he stopped chewing momentarily and said to me, Elliot, Elliot, sometimes it is better not to ask. <laughs> so, and he continues to chew. That's the meeting where he told me he had decided to pull out of Gaza. That was how the U.S. government found out about this, that, that um, he was, in fact, going to pull out. Um, but uh, that was, by the way, his decision, not something that President Bush forced on him. Uh, but we, we maintained um, contact, you know, at sort of all levels um, at all times. Um, the, the change uh, in that policy uh, really was, began at 9-11 and the president's support for a Palestinian state, but only if and when it was going to be a non-terrorist, peaceful, democratic state. Um, then Sharon decides to get out of Gaza, and we spent two years supporting that. <clears throat> And then the last two years, but particularly the last year, we're trying to get this comprehensive deal. How much of this is in the newspapers? 
Uh, what was not in the newspapers is the tension that is growing between the U.S. and Israel over this, because we are constantly asking, in my view, uh, for Israeli concessions to kind of uh, oil this mechanism of peace. And the Israelis are getting tired of it. And they think, you know, this is not the way an ally should act. Bush is kind of above this with the prime minister. So this is really Condi with the Israeli cabinet and prime minister. After the, that Lebanon war in the summer of 2006, as I, I said in my memoir, we really didn't have, Condi did not have a good, meaning non-tense, relationship with um, the Israelis. We really didn't have a non-tense, tough meeting with the Israelis. This is not in the newspapers. The American Jewish leadership, the tippy-top leadership, that is, the president of the American Jewish Committee, the president of APAC, knew this, partly because they were able to meet with the Israeli prime minister and hear this privately. Nobody thought it was useful to the United States to the president, to the Secretary of State, for this to be in the newspapers. The president knew about it. I, I, I mean, how do these things happen? You know, it's weird. The president agreed to speak to the 100th anniversary of the American Jewish Historical Society. So I went. And I didn't want to stay for the dinner. Uh, it was at some location here in Washington. So I went for the president's speech and then walked out. And as I'm walking out, he is walking out and getting into his limo to go back to the White House. And the president saw me. Uh, and waved over, you know, I'll give you a lift back to the White House, which is nice. Um, and in the back of the limo, he said to me, um, so how are things with the Jewish community? And I said to him, well, they're not so good. There's a lot of tension. And he said, there's a lot of tension? Tell me more. And I said, well, you know, people are beginning to hear very quietly, very privately from the Israelis, much, much more tension in the relationship with Condi. So he, he knew about it, but we... Uh, you certainly never saw it in the press. And in 2007, you discussed this in your book, this very uh, interesting series of very secret meetings, which I don't think get into the press at all, about the Syrian reactor that's being, being built there. This is an example of, of <clears throat> how close the relationship with the Israelis was. Because what happens in spring of 2007 is the head of the Mossad comes to Washington. The Prime Minister calls and says, I want to see the president. We have something important to show the president. So Steve Hadley is national security advisor. And I meet with the head of the Mossad because, you know, you don't have some guy walk into the Oval Office right, right. without knowing what he's going to say to the president. Um, and what they showed us was um, photos and other material that showed there is a North Korean nuclear reactor being built in Syria. I mean, North Korean, you know, I was not an expert, but if you looked at the Yongbyon North Korea reactor and this one, it's the same reactor. I mean, it's literally the same reactor. So, and we didn't know about this. We did not know about this. We did not know about this with all our satellites and everything else. So the Israelis tell us, and we, that is to say, the White House, we then say to CIA, true, confirm, and they do whatever they need to do to fully, fully confirm it. It's a nuclear reactor being built. And we then have lengthy discussions internally, U.S. government, basically White House, state, CIA, Defense Department, what are the options? Because the Israelis say to us on day one, this has to go away. We're not letting Assad have a nuclear reactor. <clears throat> so we canvass the covert possibilities, the overt possibilities, the diplomatic possibilities, um, alone and with the Israelis. We agree there is no covert. With other allies or not so no, much? No, no. At this point, there's two governments involved, uh, we, period. And there's no leaks. Um, there's no covert option. Uh, it's just too big a deal to huge nuclear reactor. Um, so it's military or diplomatic. The diplomatic is uh, obviously a farce, uh, in my view, and to my great amazement, the president chooses it. Um, the State Department, um, Secretary Rice, with the support of Secretary Gates of the Defense Department, says, let's take this to the IAEA and the UN Security Council. And the president, um, after a lengthy series of meetings, I must say the preparation was great. We had scenarios, we had papers, we had, um, I don't know, dozens of interagency meetings at my level, but also meetings with the president. Um, by the way, over in the residence part, the east wing of the White House, so that nobody would see all these people gathering in the west wing and say, what the hell's going on? And these happen without being reported <coughs> upon? That is pretty Nobody knows. unusual. Yeah. Nobody knows. And we keep all these meetings secret. I think we call it the library group. 
Um, and <clears throat> papers were not allowed to move. I kept the papers in my safe. That is, you could read a paper, but then you have to give it back to me. Um, and we meet with the president in, in his living room <clears throat> over in the East Wing. And uh, what's interesting to me about this is <clears throat> fabulous preparation. It really was the best interagency cooperation ever. Case study for public policy school. Case study for public And then the president makes the wrong decision, in my view, <laughs> which is uh, go to the UN, which the Israelis, of course, you know, with their relationship with the UN, uh, it's obvious to me they're never going to go for this. I thought uh, the Israelis should, uh, should bomb the reactor. The, the vice president thought we should bomb the reactor. Um, but the uh, vice president makes this case? Yes, the president said, what do you meeting? think? Everybody, yes. We had a, one of these series of meetings in the president's living room called the Yellow Oval Room. Um, but um, the, in the end, the president decides to try the diplomacy, which means the next morning he has to call Prime Minister Olmert of Israel and tell him this. Um, and uh, I thought Olmert would say, I have to think about this, I'll call you back. But to my surprise, I'm, I'm in the Oval Office listening to this call. Yeah, tell people how that works. That's, I, when I got to the White House and it was Vice President Kroos, Super Staff, I was sort of amazed that w when a president calls a, another president or Prime Minister, it's not just like, uh, us having a conversation on the Absolutely phone. right. I mean, I mean <clears throat> let's say the president is calling the prime minister of Israel. So the national security advisor is there, and I'm there. Well, it's set up ahead of time, I suppose, to make sure most, well, usually, right, to make exactly. sure they're both free. And, and because know. of the, you get a request, let's say, or we'll make a request. Um, and we used to do these because of, think of the time zones in the Middle East, very early in the morning, like 7 a.m., we would do these calls. Our time, so it's right. midday so it's in midday Israel. there. Um, and you'd set it up, and everybody would agree. The situation room would set up the call. And then so the, the head of the situation room, usually a military officer, would be in the Oval Office as well. And he would say, you know, please put the Prime Minister on. Uh, and then he would say, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, the President of the United States. And the President would get on and say, Ehud, how are you? Mm -hmm. um, but Hadley and I, and often the White House Chief of Staff, would be there listening uh, on, at the other end of the Oval Office on a speakerphone, of course muted and with the sound low. <clears throat> because we were going to have to follow up on this call. We needed to know. And, of course, there are people listening on the, that side as well. I do remember... And there are people taking notes to make sure... Yes, in the Situation Room, downstairs in the White House basement, they're right. taking notes. Not a tape transcript. They're just taking notes. Um, I do remember a call with Putin one time when the president announced that his daughter was getting engaged. Um, and Putin said, do you like the young man? And I remember the president laughing and saying, what the hell of a question to ask? There's probably 50 people listening to this <laughs> phone call. Um, but, but Putin could take care of the, <laughs> the 50 on his yeah, side. They yeah, would not that talk. That was not a problem. Right. Um, and the president, for the record, did and does. That's great. Yes, right. uh, he's a great guy. But um, So I'm listening to this phone call, and I'm certain that a troubled Olmert is going to say, well, that's disappointing, George. Uh, let me think about this and call you back. And that is not what happened. Olmert immediately says, no, George, <clears throat> we told you from the beginning, the reactor has to go away. So you're saying you're not going to make it go away, so we're going to make it go away. I, 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 you don't want to know anything more than that. You don't, I'm sure you don't want to know anything operational, but this is going to happen. So now I'm thinking, listening to this, woo, the president just said we're doing diplomacy, and the Israeli prime minister said, oh, yeah, no, we're not. Now is the president going to be angry? Um, the president says, in effect, uh, well, you do what you have to do. If you, you think your national security demands this, I'm not going to tell you. you do. <clears throat> Phone call ends, and the president turns to Hadley and me and says, now, that guy has guts. And he then instructs us, make sure that this remains completely secret and that no one in the United States government does or says anything that could <clears throat> limit or obstruct the ability of the, the Israelis to have to do what they want to do, which is blow up the reactor. It, it is actually two months until they blow up the is reactor. Is that right? So that's, it, this phone call is two months before, was it yeah. early September? They, yeah, it's uh, September Right after Labor Day. Seven, so right. Yeah, yeah. So this is early July. So maybe six, seven, eight weeks. It doesn't leak. It doesn't leak at their end, and it doesn't leak at our end, which, you know, in this day and age is a pretty good thing. I've often wondered if the president actually thought that was a better outcome, didn't want to tell his Secretary of State and Defense, no, you're wrong, and I'm going to tell him to bomb it, but was actually 
Not unhappy when the Israelis said, we'll take care of it. And what happens then when they do take care of it? How, when do you, I mean, to some degree you can talk about this, when do you know that there's a military operation about to happen or happening or just happened? Well, the Israelis, of course, don't uh, know. We don't want to know. It's not our operation. There are no green lights and red lights. We said that to them. Um, they don't need U.S. anything, They don't need U.S. anything. Uh, um, so we don't want to know. In this case, unlike, say, air power in Iraq, where we're right in their neighborhood, um, we're not operating <clears throat> over Syria at that point. So uh, what happens is, it's actually the president's in Asia, if I remember right, he's in India that morning, and we get a call from the Israeli uh, um, Prime Minister Chief of Staff saying... You it, do, or Hadley does? Uh, Hadley does, saying, it just happened. And we then, of course, we'd have known anyway from satellites, I think, because now we were watching it. So we then call, I guess, DOD to say, what are you seeing? And they say, yup, little seismic activity there. Something got blown up. But you don't know ahead of time. We do true. not know ahead of time. And we don't want to know ahead of time. Right. For one thing, this is now a military operation. So leaks become a matter of life and death. Generally speaking, speaking about leaks, how much of a problem is that to running a competent and serious foreign policy for a great power like ours? I mean, at times you think, how can we do anything when stuff's in the front page of the Times and the Post? Then we do seem to be able to do a fair number of things. So, We do, and there's a sense of responsibility about certain things, <clears throat> including you know things where people agree lives are at stake. But uh, what, is, what is called politics is very broad now and includes a lot of what used to be, I think, regarded as policy. There are a lot of leaks. There are a lot of, there are some, look, there's two kinds of leaks, right? The ones you want and the ones you don't want. Right, right. Every White House leaks. Uh, maybe leak is the wrong word. Every White House puts out stories to the press right. when we think it's helpful. <clears throat> but there are negative leaks. There are leaks by people in the bureaucracy um, to protect themselves or their department uh, or their leadership against the White House. And I would have to say, frankly, uh, in 2002, 3, 4, there are, for example, endless leaks from the Powell State Department um, and from pretty high up in the Powell State Department defending the Secretary, <clears throat> defending the State Department against what they view as long U.S. policy. I have to tell you, you know, that. that this is partly personal, that is, people defending themselves, but it's also partly institutional. I remember a day when the president gives, gave a big speech uh, one night. Maybe it was even a State of the Union or something, but um, he gives a big speech anyway, and it seemed to resolve a particular policy issue. And there was a meeting in the Situation Room the next day, and a guy from the State Department and I are walking out together, and he said, God, there's a lot to figure out. And I said, well, at least we don't have to figure out that thing because the president you know, set the policy last night in the speech. And the guy said to me, Unforgettably, no, no, no. Policy is not made in a speech. <laughs> policy is the product of the interagency process. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, Jesus, can you? Th I mean, <laughs> this guy's got to go. He should be gone today. Of course, he's probably still there. <laughs> but um, think of the bureaucratic mentality that a presidential speech doesn't take, doesn't set policy. Um, that, you know, only sort of 40 meetings at the deputy assistant secretary level. Oh, this is crazy. But that's what you're dealing with, at least with some people. And in some cases, you know, look, they've been there forever. Therefore, they have relationships with people covering the department for newspapers, with people covering those subjects in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, House Foreign Affairs Committee of both parties, and uh, in the NGOs and the think tanks. Uh, and they're going to use them if they think you're doing something wrong. Which, which, by the way, they may genuinely, it's not even politics, they genuinely think you're going off the deep end. But, you know, one has to go back here to the George Shultz view. Yeah, but he got elected president. Right. He gets to make the policy. Even in a lousy speech, he gets to make the policy. Eight years in the White you spent eight years in the State Department, then eight years in the White House. Conclusions about if you were advising the next president and setting up his administration, where should the center of policy be? Where would you... Uh, obviously, you'd want to have some balance and all that, but it'd be nice if everyone got along. But at the end of the day, I mean... Well, at the end of the day, the president uh, has to be the center of any administration. Um, I think the president needs to understand, though, his cabinet members. And this is not a matter of personality. His cabinet members um, are, at, in a bureaucratic sense, his enemies. Um, they have a life, right? They may have a future. They may want to run for governor, senator. 
Um, they may be protecting a reputation. They may believe in a policy that he doesn't believe in. They want to lead their department. Um, so uh, you need to set up a system. I think this is probably the lesson or one of the key lessons. A, a kind of nervous system. There's an organization chart of the U.S. government, right? And, and you can look it up on, online. There's got to be a separate one of loyalists. There's got to be a kind of nervous system of people who really uh, work for the president. Uh, maybe they worked for him previously. Maybe they worked in his campaign. But by the way, they can't just be a bunch of politicians because that means they won't necessarily know how to work the bureaucracy. But there's got to be a loyalist team throughout the government that really does believe in the president and his policies and want them to succeed and will not be loyal, frankly, to the building they happen to be sitting in, right. but loyal to him over there in the White House. Uh, if you don't have that system, you're going to lose control. And of course, in a, in a two-term presidency, this, this begins to happen anyway after the uh, election because people begin to look to their own futures and you begin to be a short, a short timer. So <clears throat> having that system in place, I think, is um, absolutely critical. And the National Security Council has to be strong. To, to really shape foreign policy. It does, and it needs to be strong intellectually and bureaucratically. I remember asking George Shultz a few years after he left as Secretary of State, what does it take to be a good Secretary of State? <clears throat> Very interesting what his first reaction was. He said, well, it helps to have some ideas. And that's a really interesting response, and you wouldn't get it from a lot of Secretaries of State. Shultz was both a fabulous bureaucrat and an intellectual. He believed in the power of policy ideas, um, the perfect Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan. And uh, so you need people in your National Security Council who are good bureaucrats, but who also have ideas or, and or believe in your ideas. You need people who are, you might say, policy intellectuals and policy entrepreneurs. You need a mix, I guess, because nobody's going to have everything you need. Right. Um, but but uh, you need that at the NSC. Uh, you're not going to get George Shultz's very often. That's just luck. Um, you need people who, who can carry this policy through and who actually understand and agree with the policy. And again, it's hard because if you think about it, at, at the top level, a lot of the staff of the NSC actually comes from DOD, CIA, and state. At that level of people who are interacting with the president, the special assistants or deputy assistants, we are talking about maybe 30 people trying to control through them and their small staff, four or five people each, this massive bureaucracy. It's hard. And so you need people with government experience and <clears throat> sort of aptitude for bureaucratic work, um, but who also understand what the president's about. What is he trying to do? What is he trying to achieve here? If you don't have that, uh, your ability to control the policy uh, will be limited and, and, and in your second term will start to, I think, disappear. And George W. Bush, who you worked for for eight years, I mean, I met him, you know, a dozen times probably, almost always in groups, like one lunch right near the end, uh, just about two or three, I guess three or four of us there in that nice little room off the Oval Office. I mean, what would su people be surprised? I mean, what, what's your judgment of him? I mean, you have a high judgment of him, of I course, do. but but what would be surprising to people, I mean, the, the, uh, about Bush? I think the first thing is just how smart he is. I mean, the press during the campaign and, and after tried to, this happens to conservatives and Republicans sometimes, try to make yeah. out that he's dumb. Um, really, really smart. Um, an omnivorous reader, which I think people didn't quite recognize. Of the, material that you all produced for him at memos or of uh, outside material? Well, both. I mean, books, for example, you, the Air Force One, I remember reading Michael Oren's book about the Middle East that had just come out and the president is walking by where I'm sitting and turns the book to see what I'm reading and says, just finish that. Is that but right? it's also true, anything you sent to, I mean, you'd go, I would go to the Oval Office, let's say, to prepare for a meeting with the uh, president of Egypt, let's say, and we had written five talking points, and the president would say, uh, good morning, he'd say, um, I don't agree with your third talking point, and I'm not going to use it. So it's obvious that he had the, wow. we sent up the stuff up the night before, and he went through it, you know, did his homework. Um, but he also had a, a, you know, a very broad network of information. Um, so very smart, a very good executive um, in terms of, of handling people. And I, I think this is another thing people don't realize. 
After 9-11, the whole country depends on this man for its morale. How do we react to this horrifying attack on us for the first time since Pearl Harbor? But it isn't even the worst, it's the mainland. Uh, and he sets the tone for the country. We bounce back. Uh, Manhattan, Yankee Stadium. Um, and, you know, as the administration wears on into six, seven, eight years, um, Again, he carries this. We've got the Iraq War. We've got thousands of Americans dead. It's becoming an unpopular war. Prior to the surge, it looks as if the war is being lost. He carries the country, and he carries the staff. Um, you know, we are allowed to get down in the mouth. We're allowed to get pessimistic. We're allowed to get tired. He's not, literally not. That is, what happens to the whole machinery of government if you have a National Security Council meeting or a White House staff meeting, and the president right. is tired and depressed. Those waves go out to the world. He doesn't let himself do it, ever. At least, maybe he does with his wife, but he does not with the staff, ever. Um, which, I mean, talk about character. Um, I think character in the White House flows always down from the top. Uh, this was a very gracious White House. This was a White House where you knew <clears throat> if there were backbiting by one staff member against another, you'd get fired. That was not allowed. We were on a team here. We had to treat each other decently. So um, graciousness, decency, uh, I mean, work ethic beyond belief, but um, uh, high, high level of intelligence and uh, political understanding. I was struck by how carefully he thought, this happened on one occasion where I was really struck by this, how carefully he thought about what the effect of what he said publicly would be, domestically and abroad. I think this was the, the surge. I was one of those pushing hard for the surge in Iraq, very critical of Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. And I think when he decided on the surge, he then had a bunch of us in, you know, columnist types, so some foreign policy think tank people. And um, it was, he was briefing us, but then he, you know, we got a chance to say something. And I think I said I thought it would help him politically here in the U.S. to make clear that he had made a pretty big break with prior policy, to say we sort of went down a path that turned out was understandable, but turned out not to be right in 05, 06, and now we're really in a different path. This was early in the surge in 07 when public support was not there yet, and it wasn't clear that it was going to work, obviously. Mm -hmm. and I remember him saying, this really struck me at the time, and it impressed me. So I can't say that. I can't say that because of the families of those who fought and who died and got wounded in 05, 06. I'm not going to tell them that somehow it was, you know, we messed it up, and that's, you know, and that they, their sons and daughters were over yeah. there fighting, and, and that, um, it, you know, we in a cause that we've, we've now fixed it. That's not fair, and I'm just not going to say that, and it's not fair to the people who acted in good faith within the administration to try to execute the policy that I said. It's not that I'm not willing to admit mistakes myself, but it would be demoralizing, I think, to the country. I'm just, I'm, we're making the changes, and of course people yeah. can see the changes, and Dave Petraeus is over there now, and Donald Rumsfeld is gone, but I'm not going to emphasize the change, although it would have been to his advantage to do so politically. No question. Well, <clears throat> uh, for, for one thing, he paid a lot of attention to the language. I mean, that is, you couldn't give him a statement that he would then read. You would take the statement, you could prepare it, you know, on cards for him to read, like in the Rose Garden. He would wordsmith it. He would, this sentence doesn't work. This doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound like me. This is not the right word. Um, he made a major speech on the Middle East in June 2002 that went through 30 drafts. And in some of the drafting sessions, uh, which would be at kind of at my level in the situation room, the president attended the meeting. And the president actually talked through, we want this tone, we want that tone, that's not right, I want this in, I don't want that in. Um, so he paid uh, a lot of attention to what he sounded like. I think the other point you make is quite right also, is, is very clear on a lot of issues. Iraq, of course, first. Um, there was a point at which, I believe in the 2006 elections, he was told by Republican leadership on the Hill, he would need to do certain things or we could lose a lot of seats. And his reaction really was too bad. Uh, the national security interests of the American people and the people we put at risk over there come first. Uh, and again, that, you know, that message immediately suffuses the White House. And it's great to think that's, that's the way your leader is in terms of character. Any particularly, you've already discussed a couple, but memorable moments, you know, personally with the president in the Oval Office or in the residence that would be, you know, striking to you that reflect that? 
character? Any funny moments in meetings? I assume he had a sense of humor, right? Well, the president yeah. had a great sense of humor. Um, this I don't know if people know that or not, but um, for example, these were probably the, fu the best, most fun moments in the Oval Office. These phone calls. Um, you have translators on the line for a lot of them, obviously, not all of them. Um, but that could make it long. After all, if you think about this, let's say the president speaks for two minutes, even one minute. Um, the translator has to translate another minute. Then the guy has to answer. It's another minute. Then that has to be translated right, back. Right. So, I mean, three minutes, four minutes sitting there is a long time. What the president used to do very often. And he, half of that time, you can't understand. It's, right, it's translating right. into it's being translated. the foreign leader's right. language and then and from it. So you don't... Exactly. You know, so, um, the president would get up and take a fly swatter and go around killing flies. There were, perhaps the Obama administration solved this, horse flies. In the Oval uh, Office? In the Oval Office, which were there when we got there. The president, had, the first time I was in a meeting there, told me they were Clinton holdovers. <laughs> um, and he would go around, you know, and you're listening to the phone call, somebody jabbering in a foreign language, and the president is not sitting at his desk anymore. He's walking around the Oval <laughs> Office, just like, whap, with his fly swatter. Uh, he was very good at it, too. He got a lot of them. But somehow or other, the doors would open from the Rose Garden, and in they would come. Um, and he made a lot of jokes. I mean, if the foreign leader was going on at too great a length. The president would, you know, put the phone down on his desk, put his feet up on the desk and go. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, so he was, he was very funny and he appreciated jokes too, of a certain kind. Um, not disrespectful ones, no bad language. Not in the Oval Office. Hmm. Um, and by the way, there was a coat and tie rule in the Oval Office. Very respectful of the office. If you were so coming you in. So you put on your coat. I mean, it didn't matter during the week, but, but if you're coming in on a Saturday or Sunday, let's say you had been out playing some sport or you were out in your garden, you go put your coat and tie on before you go into the Oval Office. You would not allow it. That didn't apply to the residents. And I guess one of the most memorable moments for me was we were doing a phone call on a, on a weekend. And so I was told where to go. You know, the White House butler lets you in. And there's a president in his sort of private office over in the residence dressed for biking, uh, you know, sneakers and shorts and everything, and, and with a cigar and, and ready to call the king of whatever. Um, I think the, the, um, uh, the humor was a part of it uh, that I remember, but also the, the toughness at times with foreign leaders. Um, the willingness to say, um, as he said to Sharon, now means now, um, or <clears throat> to raise with Mubarak, as he once did, you know, what comes after you, something nobody really wants to hear. Um, the, the, the discussions with foreign leaders about human rights questions, which are always uh, difficult. Um, the toughness of, you know, talking to Arab leaders about Israel, for example, and with the Saudi, uh, at, at that point, crown prince, now king, who said, you know, call Sharon and tell him to do this or that. And the president had said, no, I don't, that's not the relationship I have with the Prime Minister of Israel. I don't call him and give him instructions. So um, it, it's this combination, I think, that, that in my view made him an, a very effective president. Um, but uh, it was particularly, I come back to this, to this character question because, you know, the problem with being president is, unlike being almost anything else, you can't have good moments and bad moments. They've all got to be good moments. You know, you're on camera so much. And when you're not on camera, where are you? You're, you know, you're so much with your party's governors or right. senators, or you're even with your own staff. And again, he had to carry on his back the morale of the staff at all times and the morale of the country. And I think people don't recognize that enough. Um, and, and when you're in a war, a war that you seem to be losing uh, for years, that's an immense burden. And I think here's where, for him, religious faith came in. Um, and it mattered. I, I, <laughs> I mean, he could be humorous about that, too. I, I remember when, I, I won't mention which country, but there was an Arab country. The leader was coming to see him. And we always have, while the president has lunch with the leader, uh, the first lady gives lunch or tea to the leader's wife. The problem we had in this case was that that particular Arab leader had four wives. <laughs> so we had this sort of, well, how many wives do you get to bring? And, you know, this is actually a great question of state. And I remember saying to the president, uh, we, got, we have a problem. He's got four wives. You only have one wife. So how many wives does he get to bring? And the president said, no, this is America. When in America, do as the Americans do. He gets to bring one wife. Uh, I think he solved it by not bringing any wives. Um, but the president's relationship with his wife was a great tower of strength to him. 
and his religious faith. And when the president said, you know, we're praying for you, he meant that. The president once said about China uh, and religious freedom in China that one of the great differences between their leadership and ours was, he said, uh, I know that after 9-11, I had 300 million Americans praying for me, and that lifted me. They don't have that. Um, so it meant, it meant a great deal to him, I think, in being able to carry these almost inhumanly great burdens for eight years of terrorism and war and, and economic trouble. Oh, that's interesting. And for people who aren't going to be president but might aspire to be Assistant Secretary of State <laughs> or Deputy National Security Office, well, maybe, first of all, people should aspire to be president. What, what is your general sense about elective office? Do you en encourage people to think about it, or do you say, oh, it's horrible life and better off to follow the, the appointed path? Did you ever think about running? I can't remember. Not really. Uh, it just didn't. No. And, and, you know, once I got into the government and became a Republican and I was from New York, where would I run? You know, I was living in the District of Columbia then. Republicans uh, not very, <laughs> do not have not a, very good, not a yeah. strong party. Um, I meet some fantastic young people who are running or who are elected. Uh, you think of people like Tom Cotton, who's a right. new member of Congress, who's an Iraq war veteran. Um, there, are, there are people. Um, so anybody who's willing to do it, I think it's a very hard decision to make from a family point of view. You live in two places. The strains are very great. Um, but, uh, you know, the democracy we have doesn't work unless we have members of Congress who are pretty terrific. Uh, I, I think that's a very personal choice. The more sort of easier one is to get into foreign policy and government. And I, I do encourage people to do that. And I tell them, you know, look, Congress is a great place to start. Um, just get up on the hill. Don't look for, you know, yes, right, you're 25 and you just got your law degree and you would now like to be Chief of Staff of the Foreign Relations Committee. It's going to be tough. Get up there. You'll hear about the next opening from there, you know, not from the want ads in the, in the newspaper. Um, write, which is now much easier to do um, because there's so many blogs. Right. And um, you can do that. Even if you're in school, you can do that. Just write, publish, get your thoughts out there, and you'll find if they're interesting, people start referring to them and emailing them around. Join organizations. And I always tell them also, look, politics is a team sport in Washington. Don't think that you're going to rise above politics and become the world's most respected foreign policy expert. So, no, it's not the way it works. Choose a team, help that team, volunteer for campaigns, get involved. When the White House personnel system kicks in because your party has won an election, it matters a lot whether your file says you worked on a campaign or didn't. It doesn't really matter all that much. and Nobody expects you to be campaign manager as, as a young person. Did you volunteer? Did you try? Did you give your time? The answer has to be yes. So um, do it. Uh, but I, I encourage people to do that. I do tell them, I've been very lucky. I've been in the government in the years that I've been out of, out of school, out of law school, for a little over 20 years. You may get unlucky. You know, your party may have a stretch of defeats. What are you going to do? And even if you're lucky, what are you going to do when you're not in power? You can't be in all the time. Uh, there has to be an answer to that question, uh, unless you, you know, are very wealthy, which, you know, in which case, good luck. But um, if you're not, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a consultant, you're going to be a professor. What are you going to do? You're going to go to Wall Street? There has to be an answer to that question for your sake and the sake of your family. Um, recognize that people concentrate, if they want to be a so-called in and outer, on getting the best things when they're in, and sometimes they don't think enough about how do you live when you're out and provide for your family and for what may be not just years but decades? So I, I really urge them. In fact, I recently told one young man this and said, so my advice to you, knowing you a little bit, is what you should do now is go to law school. And he said to me, oh, man, you sound just like my father. And I said, sorry, <laughs> but, but it's good advice. You know, you've got to build a life that consists of the government part and the out-of-government part and just hope that you get the time in that you that you seek. I do not say to people, it's a dirty game, stay out of it, uh, you'll get investigated, the press will come down on you, it's not worth it, Washington is broken. Um, there is an element of truth in all of that, but um, the system does not work when many of the smartest and best people say, oh, okay, I'll dedicate myself to making money and having a happy family life. 
uh, both of those are important and should be part of, of that, what, 50, 40 years, let's say, after school, 50 years after school. Um, but I think people should not be so cynical. Uh, I had, you know, in many ways, a horrendous experience, right, for a couple of years in government, the Iran-Contra right. uh, scandal and prosecution. Um, nevertheless, I would say it is still worth it because your opportunity to be part of a team led by a president you believe in that is really trying to do something good for the country, uh, for the world, for the interests of the United States in the world, for our beliefs in the expansion of freedom <clears throat> is, I think, more satisfying than anything else you will do outside of your own family life. And it's worth, uh, it's worth dedicating years to. It's a good note to end on. And Thank you for that service and thank you for, for joining us today. You're very welcome.